The year was 2003, and out of all the new franchises hitting their stride on the Game Boy Advance, there weren't many that exploded just as much as Mega Man Battle Network, as after pumping out three mainline games and two spin-offs, the series had become a smash hit. All the things surrounding the series, like its anime and various merchandise, propelling its success even higher. Needless to say, things had hit their peak, many anticipating the next entry in the series after Battle Network 3. However, as quickly as the series had gained its popularity, the franchise would somehow only last a few more years. Hello everyone, this is the RPG Monger, and today let's find out how Battle Network went from consistent growth to steady decline. So picking up where we left off, after the release and massive success of Battle Network 3, Capcom had kicked things into high gear to take advantage of the booming series as much as possible, nearly immediately starting to develop Battle Network 4. And even though that game would end up releasing in less than a year after 3 came out, they'd simultaneously develop another spin-off for the franchise, Mega Man Battle Chip Challenge. Unlike Battle Network's previous spin-offs, this one actually wasn't a platformer, instead attempting to emulate what it'd be like to operate Mega Man rather than play as him. An interesting concept when you first hear about it, but man, the actual game is one of the weirdest things I've ever seen, and not in a good way. Like you see this gameplay that's on screen right now? I'm not playing any of that. It's literally just two AI fighting until one gets defeated. I kid you not, that's the entire game. You see, before battles, you set up a little board of chips that Mega Man can select from at random, two of the slots being made available for you to direct Mega Man to use in battle when a meter charges up. In that regard, it does add a somewhat strategic aspect aspect of the game, but aside from those two slots you can use, everything else is pure RNG. There are other mechanics, sure, like chips becoming unusable when they've taken too much damage, but it doesn't really matter when all you're doing is staring blankly at a game playing itself. It's a shame, too, because Battle Chip Challenge did have some interesting ideas, they just aren't executed that great at all. For one, the game gives you the option to play as other characters, two new ones being created specifically for this game. The issue there is it doesn't amount to much, as for each different character, the barebones plot barely changes at all. Plus, in the game itself, you can actually switch up the Navi you're using, another really neat thing entirely wasted on a game like this. If anything, Battle Chip Challenge is just like a lot of the modern mobile games of today, the shop in the game even being a gotcha. But despite that, making that comparison doesn't work too well, as many mobile games are far more fun. Honestly, if they just added one or two more mechanics to let Lan interact more in battle other than those two chips, it'd probably be way more fun, like maybe adding in some button prompts to deal more damage or something. Clearly, Battle Chip Challenge was just a little experimental game to cash in on the success of the series, barely any effort going into it at all, what with 90% of the game being reused assets. No joke, I went through the game hardly changing my Navi and selectable chips, and at the end when you fight base, he didn't even pose a threat. Seriously, what a waste of time. Thank god the battle theme kinda slaps, or else I would've lost my last brain salt to this game, though sadly, that brain salt wouldn't be safe for much longer, as now, it's time for Mega Man Battle Network 4 Red Sun or Blue Moon. Where do I even start with this thing? Alright, so as I'm sure you're all familiar with, Battle Network has always released its games kind of rapidly to say the least, the devs seemingly jumping from making one game to another with practically no time in between. And somehow, they'd made it work pretty well. From Battle Network 1 to 3, there was consistent improvement. However, with the release of Battle Network 4, that trend would unfortunately be broken. Though before I go over 4's more… unsavory parts, let's cover the more surface level changes first. Thankfully, the battle system works like it's always had except in the place of the style system that had been built up over the course of the first three games, Battle Network 4 introduces the Double Soul system. Basically, how it works is as you progress through the game, if you have a battle with specific navvies, Mega Man will resonate with them, obtaining the ability to take on their form in battle, and gaining new powers and certain bonuses with the chip type that corresponds to that soul. In fact, as you play further through the game and pick up more souls, you're not limited to just one per battle like styles, the game allowing you to switch them as you like. Although at the same time, there are some limiting factors to it. Unlike Styles, once you equip a soul in battle, you're only allowed to use it for three turns, and to even equip one in the first place, you need to sacrifice a specific chip type that corresponds to the soul, that function replacing the add button permanently. Unfortunately, with that, the ripple effect of implementing souls would affect how folder building worked in 4, you being kind of required to have chips in the folder purely so you can activate your souls. And to be perfectly honest, when I first tried out souls, I wasn't much of a fan, though once you get more 
later on and get to keep switching through them in fights, the whole soul system grew on me a good bit. Mind you, at this point in time, I still preferred styles, but souls in Battle Network 4 were pretty neat too. Plus, with the removal of styles, a lot of their aspects would appear again in certain souls. For me, I'd say my favorite one in the version I played was without a doubt Search Soul, but I'll get into each of the souls a bit later. Also having to do with battle, Battle Network 4 would build upon the counter system. Now, rather than just earning you some bug frags after a fight, there's the emotion window, and when you counter, Mega Man enters full synchro, a state that makes the next chip used deal double damage. I'll say right now, when you manage to deal counters back to back, it's the most satisfying thing ever in this game, since it'll also stun the enemy for a period of time. However, outside of full synchro, there's a few other emotions Mega Man can have, like anger for example. This one doesn't pop up too often, as it can only happen after taking a lot of damage at once or breaking free from a status effect, but if you get it, Mega Man not only gets the effect of full synchro, but also super armor, so it's pretty useful in a pinch. Though then, there's Anxious, an emotion that only shows up after taking multiple hits, which allows Mega Man to gain access to Dark Chips, another new mechanic for introduced. Not nearly as well thought out as full synchro or souls were, in Battle Network 4, Dark Chips are kind of a weird addition, since while on one hand they're all massively powerful, using one permanently removes one hit point from Mega Man and causes bugs to appear in battle. Although, once you've taken the penalties into account, using a dark chip activates the Dark Soul, which on the surface does seem pretty neat, as during the effects of it, while Mega Man can no longer use full synchro or double soul, he gains access to exclusive powerful chips. The issue is, for the most part, the penalties kind of outweigh the benefits when it comes to using the Dark Soul, the only other thing worth noting being Mega Man's ability to survive what would have been a fatal attack once per battle, the Dark Soul causing him to go berserk after the fact. Plus, above all that, if you did decide to rely on the Dark Soul throughout 4, you'll be in for a rude awakening upon reaching the end, as the game doesn't even allow you to utilize it against the final boss. Of course, if you really wanted to use it, there is a way to at least undo some of the prolonged effects of utilizing the Dark Soul, but in my eyes, it just isn't all that worth it, especially since the HP lost through using them can never be recovered. Literally, just relying on program advances like every other Battle Network game can lead to Mega Man being just as strong if not stronger. Unfortunately, like other aspects of Battle Network 4 that we'll be getting to soon, Dark Chips were an interesting concept with abysmal execution. But next to all that, thankfully the Navi customizer was brought back, many of the pieces obtained from Styles in 3 just being obtained normally throughout the game from places like shops and whatnot, though unlike the customizer in 3, the error mechanic would also be left behind, leading to the customizer being far simpler in comparison. Other than that, aside from the other neat addition of items appearing in battle, the only other main change concerning mechanics are the individual souls themselves. Except in order for me to properly talk about them, it's time to dive into not only the plot of the game, but the rest of its less positive aspects. Oh hold on, excuse me, did I say plot? That's my bad. When it comes to Mega Man Battle Network 4, coinciding with parts of the dev team changing, what little plot there is takes a backseat for nearly the entire game. Because once you play the game a bit, it becomes overly apparent that rather than going with the formula established in three other games, Capcom decided it'd be a good idea to fill Battle Network 4 with tournament arcs, those said tournament arcs being where Mega Man gains new souls. You see, continuing the trend set by Battle Network 3, of splitting the game into two versions, Battle Network 4 made its versions far more distinct from each other with the decision to not have any souls overlap between versions. And since they're all acquired in the never-ending tournament arcs, that means each version has exclusive tournament scenarios as well. Now thinking back to Battle Network 3, Capcom bringing back tournament arcs shouldn't be much of a problem at all considering how fun the N1 Grand Prix was, but let me tell you, after playing through 4 all the way through, I never want to see a tournament arc ever again. As unlike the N1's cohesive implementation into the plot of the game, 4's tournament arcs disrupt what little story even exists, most of the scenarios within them not having any plot relevance at all. To make matters worse, with each new scenario you're forced to complete before the fight of that bracket, most of the activities you have to do boil down to running around the internet doing menial tasks and fights over and over and over. I will admit, there are a few scenarios that were alright, but they were few and far between. Though despite all that, 
that, at least there's always the unique boss fight at the end of each scenario, right? Well, yeah, there is. Most of the time, you do get to fight a new boss after each scenario, but even that becomes old after a while, because on top of the constant filler and padding that comes with each scenario, the matchups in each tournament are randomly chosen, meaning that even when you beat Battle Network 4, odds are you'll only have half the amount of souls in the game. So if you truly want to get all the souls to access the post-game, this nightmare experience forces you to play the game three whole times minimum. Those randomized tournament arcs having a knack for pairing you up with characters you've already fought, leading to those already tedious scenarios becoming all the more painful. No joke, in all my days, I've never seen a game go to such massive lengths to stretch out what's essentially a game that's 80% filler. To try to explain just how ridiculous this is, keep in mind, if you just beat Battle Network 4 normally, the game is actually one of the shortest in the entire series. However, if you go through the agony of playing this repetitive hell to completion like I did, Battle Network 4 becomes the longest game in the series by a mile. Sure, if all the other games were like this somewhat, then fine, that's just how the series is. But following the incredible experience of Battle Network 3 with something like this makes the pain all the more intense. If anything, looking at it in the context of when it released, I have a pretty good feeling that Battle Network 4 went this direction because of the anime success, as it does kind of feel like they're trying to emulate the semi-episodic nature of the Battle Network anime. Regardless, there are a few neat things amidst this cascading failure that are worth mentioning. For instance, at the start of every tournament battle, there's a neat little intro that took me by surprise. And with the battles themselves, I did enjoy seeing some navvies return alongside their operators. Like, you can even fight role in this game. I will admit, I did enjoy that. So if, despite all its flaws, you're still someone who enjoys these arcs, I can see how it'd be possible to enjoy Battle Network 4 more than I did. But it got old fast for me. Not to mention, as you go through the game itself, the never-ending filler isn't the only indicator for how rushed this game was. And rather than explaining it, I think it'd be better if I just showed you. Yeah, out of any game I've ever played, I've never seen anything with this many translation errors and flat-out typos. Funnily enough, the further I got in, I eventually gained more enjoyment from finding and laughing at new typos than I did actually playing the game. In fact, there's even a few dialogue boxes that show the wrong portrait for who's talking, which aside from being hilarious, is insane that they never caught the mistake before releasing the game. Though while all that does is provide a few laughs at the game's expense, there'd be a far more harmful thing that slipped through the cracks. Adding on to the pile of flaws, if you're playing through the Blue Moon version of the game on a DS and reach the Woodman scenario, there's a near game-breaking bug that slows the game down an almost unplayable amount. If you manage to get through it, the game will revert back to normal so it won't destroy your file, but man, that's one hell of a bug. In fact, it's one of the few bugs of its nature publicly acknowledged by Nintendo, so needless to say, Battle Network 4 is pretty cursed on all fronts. In turn, and now that I've covered all the more blatant flaws of the game, let's take a closer look at those tournament scenarios. Going in the order of the game, let's start with the first tournament arc. As I myself played through Red Sun primarily, most of the footage will only be from that version, though I will go over the unique Navi scenarios from Blue Moon too. Plus, apologies if I missed a few of the normal Navi or Heal Navi scenarios. If you don't see me mention them, it's just because the game never gave them to me in the three times I had to play it. So going from best to worst, I'll start the first tournament arc with Yuko, a little girl who's the operator of a normal Navi. Among all the plots of forest tournament scenarios, this one is pretty out there, as once you beat Yuko in the tournament, it's revealed she's a straight-up ghost, which definitely wasn't a plotline I expected from Battle Network. Still, that and the scenario's little ghost-finding mechanic aside, I'd normally rank this one lower if that was all there was to it. Except, unlike the entire rest of the game, this scenario is the only time to my knowledge that Mega Man's existence as hub is even referenced at all. Coming from the past three entries where Mega Man's past was pretty important, it's a sad state of affairs seeing how forgotten it was 
Horizon 4. Though moving on, Number Man actually returns in this game, the whole plot of their scenario revolving around Land saving Higsby's chip shop from going under. And once you have the long-awaited rematch with Number Man, Mega Man gains the Number Soul, a personal favorite of mine since while you use it, alongside a few other perks, the custom screen gives 10 chips rather than 5. Rest in peace, Ad Button. After that, there's Aquaman, an entirely new Navi to 4 with another decent enough plot in its scenario, since as Land soon learns, Aquaman's operator Shuko is going through a rough time since she's entered the tournament solely to help pay for her brother's tuition in their deceased parents' stead. However, due to a misunderstanding, Aquaman runs away from her and floods the internet, leaving it up to Mega Man to clear things up. So after resolving that and defeating Aquaman, Mega Man gains the Aqua Soul, a soul that functions much like water-based styles in that water chips deal more damage alongside immunity to slipping on ice. But not every unique Navi gives Mega Man a new soul, just look at Top Man. Compared to the others, this scenario is kind of in the middle for me, as it's at least somewhat unique with the riddles Mega Man has to answer, though after the randomized tournament gave me Top Man's scenario over and over, it got kind of old. Decently challenging fight though, so there is that. Getting to the more worse side of things, there is Dex and Guts Man, which as much as I love them, unfortunately have a somewhat tedious scenario where Chi Sao fakes his own kidnapping and sends Lan out all over the place in order to sabotage him. I will say, Dex needs to keep an eye on his little brother. That kid must have some pretty dark connections to be able to pull all this off. Though seeing as this was one of the first scenarios I got in for, the Guts Soul Mega Man receives from Guts Man is definitely one of the better starting souls in my opinion. Like you'd expect, this one is mostly just the Guts style from the previous games, combining some of the older perks with other bonuses like neutral chips being stronger and the charge shot being replaced with a Guts Punch. In my experience, when you combine this one with a Vulcan chip or two, it makes for a pretty devastating attack. Anyways, continuing the trend of returning characters, Mr. Match of course appears in this game, this time teamed up with Fireman again. Guess they ran out of Robot Masters to make into new navvies for him. Similarly to the rest of the scenarios, Mr. Match just doesn't have too much going on, the on and off again criminal being betrayed by his lackeys. Quick side note here, I understand Mr. Match being free in Battle Network 2 since you can use the excuse that he's a fugitive, but after all the stuff he pulled in 3, how in the hell is he not in jail, much less allowed to take part in what's essentially a big public event. I suppose I am asking a bit much of this game considering the overall lack of logic that persists throughout 4. So one annoying puzzle later, Mega Man gets the Fire Soul from Fireman, a soul which is essentially just the Fire style, the only notable addition being some grass panels that appear when you activate it. Then to another scenario the game loved giving to me in each run, there's Tetsu, an operator of a heal navi. Literally all the scenario is, is a ton of fights back to back. Enough said. Below that, the last and in my opinion worst scenario of the first tournament is Sparkman's, as along with pairing Mega Man with another folder that you're stuck with for most of the scenario, the whole process of figuring out the password from the hints you get is kind of annoying. Granted, I'd still prefer this one over some of 4's other scenarios, but it got boring fast. And well, that's about it with the first tournament. Compared to the others, it's not really the worst one ever, a lot of its more annoying parts only becoming apparent in subsequent playthroughs. So moving to the second tournament, hope you all like backtracking. By far, the best one here is Roll Scenario, not as much for the scenario itself, which is essentially just going back and forth on the internet, but more just because it was pretty cool seeing them give her a fight after three games. If only Glide was so lucky. Plus, this is where Mega Man gets the Roll Soul, a far more unique soul that heals Mega Man every time he uses a chip and has a different charge shot that can remove enemy chips. While the chip removal doesn't come into play too often, the healing you can receive from this one has the potential to be a lifesaver depending on when you use it. I know at least with me, the Roll Soul saved me a good few times. So next down the line, Tamako and Metal Man return in this game, a neat surprise all things considered. It is a bit strange though, since Tamako acts like she's never met Lan before. I suppose she was an optional fight in 3, but it's an interesting decision to say the least. Again, this scenario is more of the same, the only difference being a little timing minigame at the end. More importantly, defeating Metal Man grants Mega Man the Metal Soul, another more unique one. As with the Metal Soul, if you charge a neutral non-screen dimming chip, it'll deal double damage and breakthrough guards. If you combine that with certain multi-hitting chips, off the bat, there's some pretty solid strategies to be had. Then, going on to an entirely new navi, there's Burner Man, Capcom continuing the trend of cool designs for fire navvies. On one hand, I didn't hate the scenario too much, as its plot being Mr. Match and Atsuki, Burner Man's operator, fighting over whose flames are stronger was pretty funny. Though unfortunately, the actual scenario itself was straight up just a diet version of the Flame Man scenario from 3. 
3. Aside from that, the only other thing worth talking about is Burner Man himself, because while not many fights in 4 proved to be much of a challenge for me, this one was a lot. Somewhat similar to Thunder Man in that you have to focus on two things at once, it took me a solid bit to figure out how to beat him without also taking damage from the Heat Chasers. And speaking of challenges, then there's that Woodman scenario. Horrible glitch aside, it's pretty standard as far as tournament scenarios go, plus I did enjoy getting to see Sal and Woodman again. However, far better than that, here Mega Man gets the Wood Soul, marking the return of the grass healing I abused the hell out of in 3. Not to mention on top of that, the Wood Soul also adds status ailment immunity and the ability to power up wood chips, so it's pretty solid all around. However, what isn't solid is the Video Man scenario. Oh man. Getting into some of the flat out brain numbing ones, while Video Man does have a neat design, the whole crux of his scenario being reverse controls was kind of a nightmare. Sure, if it was only that, then I might not have suffered so much, but this one pairs those reverse controls with panels that'll send you back to the start of an area. Newsflash, if you put in a purposely bad mechanic as some sort of a challenge in a game, you're still putting a bad mechanic into your game. Even worse than that, there's the Windman scenario, which although doesn't involve reverse controls, combines more backtracking with these rapidly moving tornadoes that'll also send you back to the start of an area. At least with Video Man, the little rewind panels aren't moving. With the tornadoes, sometimes it's not even obvious where the collision is located. And I haven't talked about it much until now, but wow, the random encounter rate in this game is absolute sin. Keep in mind, I've played games with random encounters all my life, and I don't know, maybe it's just me, but it felt like way too much in 4. So after that nonsense and Wind Man's operator getting drunk, thankfully there's a new soul to get, the decently useful Wind Soul. Along with removing any enemy barriers and making Mega Man immune to any harmful panels, you can also suck in enemies for close range attacks, which is a pretty cool combo if you pull it off right. Though back to filth, below even Video Man and Wind Man, there's the Crusher scenario, a heel navi trying to escape the Mafia, which in order to help them escape, Capcom thought it'd be a delightful idea to include a stealth segment. In any other game, this wouldn't be too much of an issue, but what with the limited view of Battle Network, this segment quickly became the absolute bane of my existence, because every time you're caught, it sends you all the way back to the start of that area. Honestly, if they just turned off random encounters for these, it would have been far better, but this one was frankly offensive. What's worse is in every run I did of this game, it never failed to deal out the scenario, causing me an unending amount of agony. And with that, the second tournament arc is over. Good riddance. If only that was the last one. Following the suffering that was all that, graciously, Capcom decided to not suck so much, if only for a little bit, with the Junkman scenario. Not only the best scenario of the third tournament arc, but the best scenario of the entire game, Junkman is actually a solo navi, born from heaps of junk data in Yumland's internet. And after being tricked by Junkman, once Lan recovers Mega Man from the junk heap, he laments about Junkman's sad existence, the navi sadly living out its days alone amidst all the junk. In a gesture of goodwill, the duo get some kindness data for Junk Man, the solo Navi rejecting their offer and fighting them, proclaiming how they have no need for kindness. So one heated battle later, Junk Man asks Mega Man to finish them off, revealing how all they'd wanted was to have one good fight before they died, since due to being made of junk data, they were already not going to live much longer. Out of left field, the whole plot with Junk Man is far more touching than anything else, honestly even being more compelling than the actual plot of the game. And after thanking Mega Man for being the first Navi to ever treat them with kindness, they fade away, leaving behind only the Junk Soul, a soul that's pretty interesting. Along with confusing all enemies upon activation, the Junk Soul replaces the two Dark Chip slots with Recycle Chips, chips you've already used that are randomly selected to be chosen again. It takes a bit of strategy, but if you play your cards right here, this means the Junk Soul can allow you to reuse even Giga Chips, making it kinda of formidable in the right hands. However, its charge shot is kind of situational, only being able to push objects on the battlefield. So while the Junk Soul is arguably one of the stronger souls of the game, next up is my all-time favorite throughout all my runs, the Search Soul. The only problem is, in order to get the Search Soul, you gotta do Search Man Scenario, a scenario that gets annoying real quick for an entirely different reason than a lot of the other ones. You see, at this point of the game, 4 introduces its iteration of the Undernet, by far the most confusing and infuriating one in the series at that. As before you even get to the Undernet, you need to put together a little contraption to 
to allow you to access it, the parts needed to make it being hidden in obscure places all over the net. If the tournament arcs weren't blatant filler, this absolutely is. The game forcing you to make it again in each subsequent playthrough. Better hope you can afford it too, since if you can't, you'll have a lot of grinding in your future. In turn, combined with trying to figure out the undernet's confusing layout, the search man scenario throws constant random quick time events at you the whole way through, providing a whole new kind of headache. And god forbid you pause or talk to a character without noticing the quick time event on screen, because it'll come back to bite you big time. Plus, all throughout that, there's still constant random encounters, some of which even happening mid quick time event. It's pretty garbage all around, but at the very least, there's the search soul shining at the end of the tunnel. Kind of similar to the number soul in function, the search soul grants the ability to shuffle the chips presented to you, making it the perfect tool in for to put program advances together. Not to mention, its charge shot that locks onto enemies can be incredibly useful as well. Since in my playthroughs I managed to get the search soul in the first run, it proved to be useful all the way until the end, so that alone elevates this scenario far above the rest for me. Though below that, there's the Kendo Man scenario, yet another new Navi added to 4 whose scenario is one of the more okay ones. Essentially, it's just a series of timing mini games with specific button presses, not much else. Compared to the nightmare of those last three from the second tournament, I'd take Kendo Man any day. And returning to what should be a pretty familiar face by now, there's Chod and Proto Man's scenario. Like Search Man, it's another undernet one, where this time you've got to go around unlocking doors in order to save Proto Man who'd been corrupted by dark chips. If it took place in any other part of the internet, this one wouldn't be so bad for me, but I just can't stand the undernet of 4. Weirdly enough, they even reused one of the undernet layouts from Battle Network 2, which caught me pretty off guard. The devs really must have been strapped for time if they had to resort to that. So once 4 gets its Proto Man fight out of its system, there's the Proto Soul. This time revolving around sword chips, it can be incredibly useful due to the fact that it allows Mega Man to step forward before using sword chips if they're charged up. As far as all the newer concepts go soul-wise, it's pretty straightforward. It also incorporating Proto Man's shield. Then, a fair bit worse than that, Thunder Man returns in this game, his scenario proving to be pretty standard outside of the fact that for a lot of it, Mega Man's health is constantly being drained, making for a decently annoying nuisance. Though I will say, compared to how much trouble Thunder Man gave me in 2, they made his fight noticeably easy in this game. Probably another casualty of them cramming so many fights onto a limited Game Boy Advance game. But with Thunder Man, we've reached the last soul left, the Thunder Soul. Similar to the other Elemental Souls, this one takes a good bit from the Elect style, adding on the benefit of all neutral and Elect chips paralyzing enemies, which can come in handy. It's a useful soul, sure, but since I only got this one at the end of my final playthrough, I didn't find myself using it all that much. So after that, there's Jack Bomber, the operator of a normal Navi whose scenario thankfully wasn't drawn out, also introducing a neat little mechanic as well. What was drawn out, however, was Polly's scenario, containing a boring scavenger hunt immediately followed by a confusing maze of sorts filled with battles. Basically, it's just filler. And finally, the last scenario I haven't talked about, Cold Man Scenario. Absolutely being the worst one of the third tournament, this one's plot is basically Lan trying to stop Cold Man's operator from destroying the world's climate solely due to the fact that he believes it isn't cold enough. Truly, we've reached the writing level of a Saturday morning cartoon. Hell, even some of those have more effort. What makes it worse is like a few other scenarios, this one requires you to have specific chips to progress, things taking even longer when you have to backtrack on the internet to find them. Overall, pure trash. At least the Cold Man fight was semi-interesting. So with that, those are all the tournament arcs I came across in 4. Good riddance. Honestly, I wouldn't be nearly as hard on all of these if the series hadn't shown in previous games that it was capable of so much more. Not only do these arcs show how rushed the game was, it also exudes a clear lack of effort, Junkman being one of the only ones that stand out. It's as if they took all the backtracking segments from every Battle Network game and made that into a game. What a disaster. However, now that I've properly covered all those arcs, it's time to talk about Battle Network 4's B-plot, the main story. Starting off with a pretty out there plot point, Battle Network 4's main conflict is that hurtling towards the planet, there's a massive asteroid capable of destroying everything, sending all the world's top scientists into a frenzy. But hey, who cares about that? The game surely doesn't. As per usual, Lan and Mega Man are living out their days in peace, except after visiting Electown, a mysterious vampire-esque Navi kidnaps Roll, 
leading to one of the only stages of the game. Unfortunately, keeping in line with the rest of 4, the first stage is pretty tedious too, the main mechanic making you chase bats around all the while being screwed over by random encounters. Though once you catch up to Shade Man, the game doesn't even give you a proper fight, backhanding the player with a scripted loss. What a great way to start the game. Sadly, it doesn't get much better either, because before the first tournament, the game squeezes in more filler for you to do, it all basically boiling down to the type of stuff side quests made you do in previous games. Like at least with 3 for example, all that stuff is optional, not mandatory to proceed. Anyways, right before the first tournament, there's a slight sliver of plot sprinkled in, for introducing a character named Regal, who alongside being one of the world's top scientists, also hails from one of the most unruly authoritarian nations of the world. If it wasn't obvious, he's the main villain of the game. But before seeing Regal and any of the scientists figure out how to deal with the asteroid, it's tournament time, land fighting some of the characters I talked about earlier. Afterward, in the brief period of time before the next tournament, Lan and Mail go to a theme park, the new area being the location of the game's only other stage aside from the final one. Though before I talk about that, I have to mention the crossover this game takes part in, as it'll be a mainstay for the rest of the series. Backing up a bit, around the same time as Battle Network's success, Konami started a new series on the Game Boy Advance called Boktai, a little-known man named Hideo Kojima being one of the main people working on it. To summarize, the games revolved around a boy named Django defeating vampires, except that's not all. Interestingly, each game cartridge came with a built-in light sensor, encouraging players to play the game in the sunlight in order to charge up Django's weapons. It's a novel concept that proved to be generally successful for a bit. And man, Battle Network sure did try to promote it. There's more crossover stuff later, like Hideo Kojima straight up existing in Battle Network, but next to certain ships being references, the theme park has multiple references to the series. Just take the second stage, spread out between different theme park robots that go haywire. Like the first stage, this one is also pretty mind-numbing, each robot having puzzles where Mega Man needs to fill in the blank, and the entire process taking forever to get through. The only thing of note is at the final robot, you're essentially filling in the blanks of a scene from Boktai, which was pretty funny. And at the end, instead of coming up with a cool navvy that fits the stage, Shade Man shows up again. This fight not being a scripted loss, but a scripted win, as this is where the game teaches you how to use dark chips. I swear, after this point, I never wanted to see Shade Man again. To make matters worse, immediately after that stage, Battle Network 4 sucker punches you with quite possibly one of the laziest portions of the entire game. Somehow worse than the mandatory side quests needed for the first tournament, to get into the second one, Lan and Mega Man have to collect 50 points scattered all over the world. That's it. Like, I'll admit, at this point, I had to pull up a guide, because having to backtrack through every area to get these points is such a baffling decision on Capcom's behalf, I still can't comprehend it. Better hope you remember their locations for your future playthroughs too, the pain never ends. So after doing that and going through the second tournament, a new Navi makes an appearance, Laser Man. Even though you wouldn't think it considering the game's layout, Battle Network 4 also brings in a new crime syndicate called Nebula, the group being solely responsible for the proliferation of dark chips. In turn, once he uses one of Mega Man's friends against him, Laser Man takes his leave, and in the meantime, all the world's scientists have come up with a laser to destroy the oncoming asteroid, the laser mysteriously being sabotaged. So that's enough plot for now, time for another tournament arc. At least this one has some plot relevance, as the tournament is being held to find a net battler strong enough to help the scientists out, but come on, Lan literally saved this society three times now. Does he really need to prove himself against dumpy idiots like this? I digress. With all pacing annihilated, the final tournament ends, the game going into the final stage after yet another backtracking segment across the internet. Oh, and Regal finally betrays the scientists at this point, the game revealing that he was Nebula's leader all along. Wow, I'm so surprised. <laughs> now being fair, at the end of the game with the final stage, it's not the worst thing in the world. Unlike the first two stages, it's not nearly as brain dead, coming packaged with a good theme to boot. Admittedly, I could have done without the random moments of button mashing to keep Mega Man from being sent back to the start, but it's preferable to the other stages that's for sure. And once Mega Man curb stomps Laser Man for good, the true driving force behind the asteroid is revealed, Battle Network's rendition of Duo. Much like their main series counterpart, Duo is of extraterrestrial origin, seeking out the evil in the universe to destroy it. However, unlike their original counterpart, Duo.exe is kind of a big idiot, traveling across the universe and using its asteroid to destroy entire planets it deems to contain evil life. I will say, the concept is an interesting one. Too bad the game 
doesn't develop or even mention Duo in the slightest before this point, massively decreasing whatever amount of impact the scene was supposed to have. What is kind of cool is before fighting Duo, they extract Mega Man's Dark Soul to create Dark Mega Man, a boss which turns your strategies against you by using chips currently in your folder. Aside from the final boss, I'd say without a doubt it's one of the more engaging fights of the game, at least until the AI becomes stupid and continues using the Mega Buster against you. But beyond that, whereas most of Battle Network 4 is fairly easy, Duo is one of the hardest final bosses in the series, no joke. After all, nothing sends you into an intense panic quite like a million punches hitting the stage faster than you can keep up with. And if you feel proud of beating Duo the first time, don't worry, with every playthrough they get even stronger, Duo's final form being the hardest fight in not just Battle Network 4, but the entire Battle Network franchise. Needless to say, I never want to see Duo again. I wasted more time trying to beat all their forms than I'd like to admit. Though back to the plot, with the defeat of Duo, the crisis is averted. Duo changing their mind about destroying Earth after witnessing the sheer determination of Lan and Mega Man, stating that one day they'll return far in the future to judge Earth again. So with that whole situation resolved, all that's left is Regal, who despite harming himself to help Lan stop Duo, remains dead set in his mindset of spreading evil. Except as it's revealed, Regal is actually the son of Dr. Wily, his father's fall from grace being the main reason he'd become the way he is. And after stating that he'll stick to his beliefs until the end, Regal straight up jumps off the building, the game near immediately cutting to credits. Out of all the endings in the series so far, I don't think I've ever had one deal such a massive amount of whiplash that I just needed to recover for a moment after the fact. In a game whose plot is near devoid of any weight whatsoever, it's a pretty big power play to sneak that in right at the very end. Sure, there is a scene of Lan getting a trophy after the credits, but for the most part, Battle Network 4 ends on its main villain supposedly attempting suicide. However, like every other Battle Network game, 4 also has a post-game. Incorporating the aforementioned feature of forcing the player to play the game a minimum of three times, Battle Network 4's post-game can't be accessed without having all six souls obtainable in the version you have, a design choice that if 4 didn't have, I wouldn't hate this game nearly as much. Seriously, to anyone out there who's planning on going through this one, if you're dead set on it, please don't do the post-game, I guarantee you it's not worth it. Because after going through all that suffering multiple times over, the game making enemies harder in each new run, the post-game starts with everyone's favorite super boss, Base.exe, his character unfortunately being whittled down to merely being battle hungry and nothing else. Granted, I guess there is the excuse of Base's memory being wiped due to Alpha, though it's a real bummer seeing them ditch all the frankly really interesting development he got in 3. At least they didn't take away his strength, as Base remains a decently formidable foe. So once you take care of Base and a few other requirements, Mega Man enters Black Earth, the laziest post-game of the entire series. Compl Composed of merely a recolored Undernet, unlike every post-game before it, Black Earth doesn't introduce a single new boss, more so containing stronger versions of bosses you've already fought. Again, much like the rest of 4, if all the games didn't have substantial post-games, I wouldn't care that much at all, but coming from 3's stellar post-game area, Black Earth is an extreme disappointment. Sure, at the end of it there is a new fight with Dark Mega Man, which grants you the ability to undo the prolonged effects of Dark Chips, but that's honestly kind of it. Harder base fights aside, 4's post-game does not remotely make up for the amount of time it takes to access it. The entire experience of playing the game three times to get to what is fundamentally more undernet, leaving me completely defeated. If we're talking about playing through the game once and that's it, 4 is a far more inoffensive game, many aspects having added tedium, but still maintaining a fair bit of fun from the battle system. It's only when you make the mistake I made of trying to see everything in the game that 4 quickly becomes a never-ending waste of time. So solely due to that, in my opinion, Battle Network 4 is not only the worst game in the series, but it's a genuine contender for one of the worst games I've ever played. Not a day goes by that I'm not thankful for never having to touch this game again. And with that, now that I've gotten sufficient revenge against 4 for eating up a great majority of March for me, it's thankfully time to move on.
Now before we get to the next game after 4, I feel this is a good point to at least address the Battle Network anime, as considering how much it influenced 4 and in general propelled the series to even greater heights popularity-wise, it's worth a mention. Localized as Mega Man NT Warrior, the Battle Network anime is shockingly large, it all totaling to 209 episodes spanning across 5 seasons. Similar to other shows like it at the time, NT Warrior is kind of an amalgamation of aspects from the games. Every now and then, an episode coinciding with a segment from the games, but it doesn't happen often. In fact, the further I watched, I noticed the plot eventually sheds any resemblances to the games at all, the only shared aspects being the characters. And while it does have that early 2000s feel to it on occasion, I generally enjoyed seeing all of Battle Network's navvies animated. For one, in the episodes I did see of the show while gathering footage for this segment, it was pretty cathartic to see the show's surprisingly well-animated death scene for Shade Man at the end of the second season. Looks like I'm not the only one who crew to hate that Navi. Though as it'd take a bit for the show to be dubbed outside Japan, only two out of its five seasons would actually receive dubs, the three other seasons only airing in Japan. In fact, it'd be so successful in Japan that it received a full-on movie. They definitely capitalized on base, that's for sure. Plus, aside from the anime, Battle Network also had an accompanying manga that last for about as long as the game series would, all its 13 volumes being brought to the West bearing the NT Warrior name to coincide with the show. It's pretty crazy looking back and seeing how much of a big franchise Battle Network was at its peak, spanning across multiple forms of media like a lot of other heavy-hitting franchises. But now, let's go back to the games and see just how 4 would affect things. Despite Battle Network 4 being noticeably worse in both quality and gameplay compared to the rest of the series, following the massive success of 3, 4 proved to do even better, the game coming out right at the peak of Battle Network's popularity. The downside to that is while now many people knew about Battle Network, 4 had tarnished its reputation a fair bit. So just like they've always done, Capcom immediately began producing Battle Network 5. Although much like before, they'd release another game in the meantime to hold people over, Mega Man Battle Network 4.5. Similar to Battle Chip Challenge in that this game also tries to emulate operating a navvy rather than playing as one, 4.5 is a very experimental game, in some ways for the better and others not so much. You see, the game was made with a specific accessory in mind, the Battle Chip Gate, an add-on only released in Japan that allowed players to insert real chips into it for navvies to use in-game. The thing is, since it was solely released in Japan and the e-reader hadn't done too well in the West, 4.5 would never receive localization, an English patch for the game only being completed recently. It's a shame, honestly, because compared to Battle Chip Challenge, 4.5 is a far superior game, the devs clearly putting effort into it, a shocking concept I know. As unlike any other Battle Network game, 4.5 takes the Battle Chip Challenge concept up to a whole new level, full-on simulating what it'd be like to have a pet. Again, kind of like certain mobile games, the game is designed to be something you check up on a bit every day, specific things like tournaments only taking place at set times. Granted, this means if you go into it like I did, expecting to get it all done in one go, 4.5 isn't exactly built to be played like that, so enjoyment very much depends from person to person. Though enough talking about that, what I'm sure you all want to know is how did they improve on Battleship Challenge's lackluster system? Well, for one, they entirely ditched it, instead going for the approach of the player controlling nearly everything except for your navvy dodging attacks. Now, to use chips randomly selected from the folder, you have to wait for the custom gauge to charge up, rarer chips requiring the gauge to be charged further. Thankfully, that's not all either, as rather than waiting for the gauge to charge up, you can tell your navvy to attack, each non-chip attack speeding up the gauge. Overall, it's pretty much everything Battleship Challenge was missing, so it's nice to see that they actually learned from their mistakes. Now, when it comes to me, I'd still prefer playing a normal Battle Network game, but I can see how a lot of people would enjoy 4.5. Although, I still haven't mentioned the real drawing point of the game. You see, keeping in line with the game being a pet simulator, 4.5 brings back the ability to choose who you play as. Except instead of only presenting 6 options, 4.5 offers a grand total of 21 unique navvies to play as, each with a slightly different playstyle and other special tidbits. For that feature alone, 4.5 was escalated far higher for me than it would have been, because next to solid pixel art, each navvy gets its own theme for the pet screen, more often than not being a remix of the themes of their original counterparts. Hell, you can even play as base in 4.5. If that isn't a massive selling point, I don't know what is. But what with the only easily accessible way of playing this game being through a third-party device, I'd personally recommend unlocking all the navvies beforehand so you can have fun playing as your favorite navvies. Thus, as a whole, 
whole, 4.5 is on the upper end of the spectrum when it comes to Battle Network spin-offs. It's not something I'll actively come back to, but I can understand if other people enjoy it. And aside from the actual game itself, what is pretty important to note is this game served two purposes for Capcom. First, there's the obvious one of filling the void between Battle Network 4 and 5, but the other, far less known one, was to experiment with other playable navvies, a concept that'd see a return far sooner than you'd think. In turn, now that we've at last gotten through the franchise's darker ages, we've reached the light at the end of the tunnel. Mega Man Battle Network 5, Team Proto Man, or Team Colonel. Releasing a year after Battle Network 4, I'll be upfront about 5. Personally, I enjoyed it a lot. Keeping in theme with Capcom learning from their mistakes, 5 is much more in line with the first three games, ditching tournament arcs altogether in favor of the usual mix of internet and stage gameplay. However, unlike any other game in the franchise, 5 is noticeably a bit more divisive amongst Battle Network fans, the reason for that being an all-new gameplay element called Liberation Missions. To put it simply, Liberation Missions are turn-based tactical segments spread throughout Battle Network 5, where the goal is to liberate specific panels to fight a boss at the end, each liberation action you make leading to a new battle. Except rather than just more normal fights you'd have all over the internet, the fights coming from these panels work a bit differently. For one, you've got to win in three turns, off the bat making them pretty challenging. Plus, depending on if you're surrounded by other panels or not, the game may change how many panels you have access to in each fight. When you first learn about liberation missions, they seem pretty daunting, but after some time, you get the hang of it. And if you manage to beat a fight in one turn, a whole bunch of panels will get liberated outside of the one initially chosen, a feature I personally found to be really rewarding. In essence, liberation missions are a combination between Battle Network gameplay and the kind of stuff you'd see in something like Fire Emblem, a lot of your enjoyment of 5 kind of depending on whether you enjoy liberation missions or not. For me, I liked liberation missions for what they were, the introduction of playable navvies with unique skills being a load of fun. Although sadly, Liberation missions do come with a flaw that I can understand people disliking them because of it. You see, at the start of every Liberation mission, the game gives a goal for how many turns the player needs to beat the mission in order to receive an added reward. Yet if the player completes the mission even quicker than the goal, the game grants a different reward, meaning if you're someone who strives to get everything in the game, that'll require you to play each Liberation mission multiple times to collect everything. Compared to the repetitiveness of 4, I'd still take Liberation missions over the tournament arcs, but I will admit that aspect of them kind of sucks. Though outside of that, 5 was an overall great time for me, many of the things 4 introduced being far more refined in 5. Take Dark Chips for example. They do make a return in 5, HP deleting mechanics and all, however they now have another far more beneficial use, as when you reach a certain point of the game, 5 introduces a new mechanic called Chaos Unison, where upon selecting a certain Dark Chip that corresponds to a Soul Unison you have, Mega Man syncs with the Dark chip, creating a way to use them without all their crippling penalties. Nevertheless, there is a catch. To use the chip this way, you have to time Mega Man's charge shot perfectly, since if you don't, Dark Mega Man will appear to demolish you. Truly, the added mechanic is high risk, high reward, and man if that reward isn't the sweetest. Just take my personal favorite, Dark Invisibility. If you use it through Chaos Unison, Mega Man goes full 8 mode, attacking the enemy with a barrage of everything. It's without a doubt one of the most satisfying additions to a Battle Network game so far, and also, Souls make a return in 5, their mechanics remaining essentially the same other than the newer old navvies they're based on. Though even better than all that, like I mentioned before, Battle Network 5 properly introduces the ability to play as other navvies, by far my favorite addition in the game. I'll elaborate further when I go over 5's plot, but just being able to try out navvies with different play styles was so cool. Plus, keeping in line with how 4 approached version differences, 5 mainly focused its differences on souls, the corresponding navvies also differing depending on the version, which aside from a couple dialogue changes, doesn't really affect the story. But aside from 5's gameplay changes, there is one other thing that makes 5 stand out among the rest, since like the first game, Battle Network 5 would receive a DS port, introducing many quality of life improvements alongside including both game versions. For one, instead of other navvies only being playable in Liberation missions, now Mega Man can get help from or switch to navvies 
navvies you've selected in battle, a feature that made internet-only segments far more enjoyable. Granted, during important portions like stages, the feature does get turned off to prevent abuse, but its inclusion at all is much appreciated. Plus, like a few other early DS games, 5's DS version makes use of the handheld's Game Boy Advance slot, except when compared to others, it's got to be one of the games that used it the most, since alongside unlocking special battle theme remixes, if you put in one of the older Battle Network games, if you put in Boktai 2 or Battle Network 5 with a save file containing the base icon, it'll give Mega Man two new perks. For Boktai, continuing the crossover started in 4, Mega Man will gain the Solar Cross, a transformation that gives Mega Man an appearance inspired by Boktai and entirely new abilities. Plus, if Mega Man is jacked in outdoors in the game world, he'll gain even more abilities, emulating the Solar Sensor used in Boktai's first two entries. Though even cooler than that, there's the Base Cross, a transformation that depending on which version of the game is in the slot, will give Mega Man the appearance of a gold or silver base, the different variations having slightly different abilities. Fun fact, Base Cross was actually in the Game Boy Advance version too, but as it was a tie-in with the Battle Network movie, it was a Japan exclusive. And aside from being a powerful transformation in general, the Base Cross in particular also unlocks some bonus content. However, I'll go into that a bit later. Unfortunately, while the DS version is superior overall, it does have a few downsides as well. Since like many early DS games, it falls into the trap of forcing use of the touchscreen to no added benefit, mainly with its atrocious folder screen. After some time, you do get used to it, but man, was it so hard to just stick with what's worked for the rest of the series? Even so, as annoying as that change was, nothing was quite as appalling as Capcom's other addition, voice acting. Now don't get me wrong, voice acting done right can add a great deal of charm to any game, even when the voice acting is sporadic at best. The main issue here is the voices they chose were… well, maybe it's best if I just show you. Jacket! Mega Man! Execute! We can do this! Navi Chain! Shadow Man! Not bad, Lan! Oh, and don't worry, they didn't just voice Lan and Mega Man. I'm counting on you, Lan Hikari. Here it comes, Hikari. This can't be real. To be fair, the further you play through the game, the bad voice acting kind of becomes white noise, but I really want to know. Who in the world thought it would be a good idea to have Mega Man make a death rattle during fights? I'll never be able to use Vulcans the same way again. Even better, then there's Colonel, whose forced accent makes him impossible to take seriously. Guess this is the price you've gotta pay for quality of life improvements. Glad to know Proto Man smokes a pack of cigarettes a day. But with that, those are about all the notable changes made in the DS version. From here, let's now dive into Five's plot, a storyline which thankfully returns to the usual quality you'd expect from Battle Network pre-4. Taking place a month after the events of 4, Battle Network 5 opens with Dr. Ikari fixing to tell Lan some important news. But to his dismay, things take a turn for the worse fast, as Nebula appears yet again, returning from 4. And as it turns out, Regal survived all along, making 4's ending far less dark as a result. So coming back, evil facial hair and all, Regal wastes no time kidnapping Dr. Ikari and stealing all the kids' pets. Though despite taking all the precautions he could, Lan happened to be obscured from view when Regal gassed the room, saving Mega Man from being stolen. And upon checking the internet after Nebula made their move, Lan finds out they've practically taken over everything. I've gotta hand it to him, compared to all the other games, Regal is immediately one of the more successful villains. Guess he learned what not to do from his failure of a father. So with a solid base for the plot being set down within the game's first hour, it's time for the first stage, taking place in none other than the Scilab. I swear, while 4 did have good music as well, getting to 5 and seeing the game return to form was such a satisfying experience for me, the first stage of the game dealing out a solid track. Beats that speaker stage, that's for sure. Even the main mechanic of the stage was decent, it coming down to creating the correct word based on a hint. Kind of a similar take on that one stage from Battle Network 2. So past that, at the end of the stage, this is when version differences start coming into effect. And for the sake of keeping confusion to a minimum, I'll mostly talk about the game from the perspective of the kernel version, as it's the main one 
I played. In turn, once coming face to face with Colonel at the end of the stage, he challenges Mega Man to a battle, it all actually being an elaborate test. Because after beating Colonel, Beryl, his operator, invites Lan and Mega Man to join Colonel's anti Nebula Corps, a team of elite navvies brought together to liberate the internet. Finally, after all the world saving feats Lan and Mega Man have accomplished, it feels like Battle Network 5 actually treats the duo like accomplished heroes, the game immediately thrusting the two into action. So one liberation mission later, Mega Man and Colonel trounce Blizzard Man, the navvy sent by Nebula to manage the ACDC area. Among all the games so far, 5 really has one of the strongest starts, and the story only improves from here. Since next, Lan gets to hang out with his friends some, Yai taking the group to the scenic Oran Island, complete with an abandoned coal mine that Lan's friends get trapped in near immediately. To make matters worse, the mine turns out to be not so abandoned, an act of Jarell extracting the precious magna metal only found on the island. And weirdly enough, when Lan reaches the drill, Princess Pride returns, apparently reformed since her appearance in 2. Before Lan's friends happen to fall into a chamber beneath the drill, Pride's navvy Nightman went haywire due to the magna metal's magnetism, causing the drill to follow suit. Thus, to save his friends from an early burial, Mega Man enters 5's second stage. Again, pretty straightforward with its mechanics, the drill comp is composed of a variety of conveyor belts, Mega Man having to break through rocks to reach the end of each part of the stage. Then, once he reaches Nightman, the two have a rematch, Nightman retaining a lot of his old attacks. Not gonna lie, since Nightman originally proved to be a bit of a challenge for me back in Battle Network 2, it was pretty satisfying demolishing his fight in one go here. And with Nightman brought back from his berserk state, Lan's friends are saved in the nick of time, Nightman helping Mega Man out to return the favor. Up until now, 5 was a generally good time for me, but this is the point where I really began to love the game, as after his stage, Lan invites Pride and Nightman to join the team, the two becoming permanent members and Nightman now being accessible to be played as. I've said it before, but going into this game not knowing anything about it, I audibly gasped when I realized Nightman was playable, since I'd always wanted to see more of him after 2. I mean seriously, they straight up chose one of the largest navvies in the series to make playable. How cool is that? Plus his walk cycle exudes power. And before I forget, this is also where the game gives Mega Man his first soul, the Night Soul being a pretty decent one to start with. Focused on breaking chips and defense, the Night Soul may not have much range, but it packs a pretty strong punch. Though so I don't neglect the Proto Man version, as opposed to Night Man, Magnet Man becomes playable, which although is pretty cool as well, I feel Night Man meshes more with the team in comparison, Magnet Man barely even wanting to be there in the first place. Not to mention, Magnet Man's operator Tesla Magnus first appears as an incredibly selfish individual, actively forcing Mega Man through the drill comp rather than helping him. Granted, she does become nicer later on, and it is interesting to see her operate her father's navvy, but honestly, her actions deserved far more consequences than just letting her off after she apologized. However, as opposed to the characters, the Magnet Soul is decently useful, combining the abilities of paralyzing and dragging in enemies to make for some pretty easy combos. Anyways, once the team utilizes Nightman's guard ability to defeat the Nebula Navi that must not be named, Orange Internet gets liberated. I haven't mentioned it much up until now, but 5's enemy and chip variety is refreshing coming from 4. Never again will I take these kinds of things for granted. So moving on, past the Orin debacle, Regal is shown to be searching for some specific thing he believes Dr. Hikari knows about, the villain even being shown torturing Lan's father in order to get it. Man, Lan's dad really never catches a break in these games. It seems like he's always thrust into a new world-threatening crisis every couple of months. But going back to Lan, 5 continues the trend of breaking back old characters with the return of Dusk, Shadow Man's operator. Initially, he doesn't do much outside of putting Lan through a few tests, though once Mega Man makes it through them all, topped off with the third Shadow Man fight in the series, Colonel reveals Dusk had already joined the team, the mercenary putting Lan through some tests just to make sure his bond with Mega Man was up to snuff. As a result, with the next Liberation mission, following the gameplay pattern 5 has established, Shadow Man becomes the next playable Navi, an addition that to be frank is even cooler than Nightman. Like sure, his Proto Man counterpart Gyro Man is neat too, but there's no topping a character that's been a formidable boss in two games already. His game 
gameplay doesn't disappoint either, the charge attack of throwing shurikens being low-key broken if you use it right. So using Shadow Man's ability to sneak over enemy tiles, Cloud Man doesn't stand a chance, Colonel's team netting yet another victory. Or at least it seems that way, since in a last-ditch effort, Nebula manages to kidnap Mega Man, severely crippling the team and devastating Lan. However, with Beryl's motivation, Lan is able to regain his drive, the leader even lending Colonel to Lan until he manages to get his brother back. And as it turns out, Lan would reunite with Mega Man far sooner than expected. The only catch being that while kidnapped by Nebula, Mega Man was corrupted by Dark Chips, changing the Navi into Dark Mega Man. Overall, it's a pretty low point for Lan, his loss is progressively getting worse. But there is a glimmer of hope, as according to Beryl, Nebula is planning on stealing a special program aboard a cruise ship, leading to Lan and Colonel investigating the scene. For the most part, there didn't seem to be much amiss, except right Right when the program was revealed, some unknown party immediately stole it, the Nebula agent on board admitting that they didn't do it. To make matters worse, that same rogue individual sabotages the ship, it being none other than the kid Lan saw earlier on, Dingo. Apparently, the company that produced the special program was also responsible for harming his village, Dingo taking things into his own hands to exact revenge. So to put a stop to Dingo, Lan jacks Colonel into the ship comp, undoubtedly the worst stage in the game. You see, to get through each area, Colonel needs to find certain keys, the main obstacle being the implementation of an oxygen mechanic, Colonel constantly taking damage if you don't continuously find more oxygen. And past the nonsense logic of a program needing to breathe, all throughout the stage are various currents which can set you back a considerable bit if you happen to fall into the wrong one. However, despite all that, I didn't really hate the stage too much, mostly due to the fact that above all its flaws, Capcom paired one of five's best tracks with this stage, so I was kind of vibing through a lot of it. Anyways, a couple drownings later, Colonel reaches the end of the stage, coming face to face with Dingo's Navi, Tomahawk Man. Out of all the old Robot Master designs, they really had to pick that one, huh? At any rate, in the actual boss fight itself, this one was a bit more challenging, Colonel's charge shot kind of saving me. So with that situation diffused, right before Colonel deletes Tomahawk Man, Lan stops him, instead imploring Dingo to atone for what he's done, the kid accepting Lan's offer and officially joining the team. And with his power, the next list Liberation mission is a breeze, the team encountering Dark Mega Man at the end of it. Except stepping back a bit, with Tomahawk Man's counterpart, this is one instance where I kind of preferred the Navi in that game, as they bring back Napalm Man of all Navis. Definitely didn't think they'd reuse one of two super bosses. This time actually having an operator rather than working for World 3, Napalm Man is another really fun one to play as, his charge shot merely being a rapid fire of bullets, making for a strong ally. Not to mention his long range liberation ability allowed me to cheese a lot of the liberation missions from then on. So back to Dark Mega Man, after the team curb stomps him, Mega Man just barely overcomes the alter ego Nebula had created within him, the game introducing Chaos Unison with his recovery. But that's not all, as due to Mega Man being away for a bit, the game opens up two new souls at once, Shadow Soul and Tomahawk Soul and Kernel version, and Gyro Soul and Napalm Soul and Proto Man version. Starting with the Shadow Soul, it actually brings back certain aspects of the Shadow style, with the added benefit of a long sword charge shot. It's not a bad one, but personally, I've never been the best at activating the anti-damage ability. Then, with the Gyro Soul, Five's take on a wind-centric soul, a lot of its use comes from the combination of air shoes and float shoes built into the transformation, making it especially useful against certain fights. And even more useful, there's the Tomahawk Soul, this game's wood soul. I'll be real, just like I did in Battle Network 3, I may have relied on this one to a fault from this point onward. That grass healing combined with the life sword range of the charge shot, proving to pave the way for some quality cheese. Though lastly, there's the Napalm Soul, Five's Fire Soul, which unless your folder has an abundance of fire chips, wasn't too useful for me compared to the others. So with all that new power added to Mega Man's arsenal, let's proceed to the latter half of Five's story. Not too long after Mega Man was recovered, Five wastes no time in introducing the next member of the team, for once the version differences actually being near equal with the return of Higsby or Rika, their Navi's number man and search man appearing with them. At least this time, the team managed to get a new member of the team without some big confrontation beforehand. Or well, not until a bit later, because as Lan and Mega Man try to uncover the thing Dr. Ikari was trying to show them earlier on, they stumble upon a hidden area of the internet called a Vision Burst. The 
area weirdly looking like ACDC Town in the year Lan and Hub were born. Though outside of it being a technological marvel, there's not more to it than that. Mega Man fixing to leave when the area gets invaded by Nebula Navvies, the criminal's leader appearing to be none other than Number Man. Shocked by his betrayal, the brothers barely have any time to recoup before the communications center of the internet begins experiencing errors for some reason, the crisis sending Mega Man to the internet of N-City to try and fix the issue, only to then be sent to the gargoyle at the top of N-City's castle as it doubles as the main communications server. And of course, Nebula is the culprit of all these events, forcing Lan to complete various security protocols to get to the gargoyle. Of note, that one minigame where you've got to hit a hundred robots without failing once was straight up one of the most intense things in the entire series. I don't even want to say how many tries that nightmare took me. Though after that, Lan reaches the gargoyle, a stage that's definitely on the longer end of the spectrum. But unlike the last one, I kind of liked the main mechanic here. Basically, to progress through certain obstacles, the game requires Mega Man to bring along a program that corresponds to the obstacle, things becoming more complicated when the game requires more than one program to progress. I'll admit, it does take a second to fully grasp. However, once you do, it's a solid series of puzzles. So after spending a good chunk of time doing that, Number Man awaits Mega Man at the end, since similarly to what Mega Man saw before, Number Man was betrayed by Mega Man, the two seemingly being driven against each other in order to spark a battle. And one battle later, the perpetrators behind driving the two apart show up only to be beaten mercilessly soon after. In turn, with the return of both Number Man and the internet's stability, the team is whole once more, Mega Man also gaining a new soul. Except if you played 4, it isn't all that new. The Number Soul, and in the Proto Man version, the Search Soul, working essentially just like they did before. Not to diminish them or anything, I was personally really pumped seeing these two come back. And with that, it's on to the next liberation mission, Number Man's ability to extract items or delete traps from the panels that have them, proving to help out a lot. Like on a side note, it's so cool that they made the second boss of the series playable. It's pure fan service, sure, but it's some top quality stuff. You'll need his help too, because Cosmo Man, the boss of this stage, is one of the more challenging fights in the game. I swear, those Cosmo planets he shoots out just kept sneaking up on me. But with a well-timed attack, Nebula loses its last Navi, the only area of the internet left under its control being the dreaded Undernet. So taking time to regroup, the team jacks out for the day, Lan catching up with his friends only for five to reach into Battle Network 2 yet again to bring back a character, the one chosen this time being Rabita, Toad Man's operator. Ever on the prowl for a big scoop, she asks Lan how to get into the Undernet, not heeding any of his warnings about how dangerous it is. And in a fit of frustration, Rabita storms off, proclaiming she'll find it herself. Though we'll come back to her later. Back at the Scilab, Beryl has some important information for Lan, letting him know that Regal is after something called the Hikari Report, meaning that was possibly what Dr. Hikari tried to show Lan before being kidnapped. So retracing his steps, Lan finds himself back at the Vision Burst, everything still appearing just as it had before, minus Gao, the dog owned by Lan's grandfather. Sensing that something is amiss, Colonel lets Lan know that the inhabitants of Vision Bursts can't just get up and leave, meaning that Gao was never a part of it to begin with. As a result, after going on a Gao scavenger hunt, Mega Man discovers another Vision Burst, this time of Orin Island in the past. Like the one of ACDC Town, nothing seems too strange, except upon closer inspection, Mega Man finds Gao again, chasing him around a bit, only for Nebula to snatch the dog in the nick of time. And that's not all, since in another aggressive move on their part, Nebula attacks Scilab at its core, forcing the team to choose another location for their HQ. Luckily for everyone, there's a glimmer of hope, as with Higsby being the owner of his chip shop, there's some room in the back of it for Team Colonel to continue operations. But as soon as it came, that glimmer quickly got snuffed out, since after having to save Toad Man due to them trying to get into the Undernet, Colonel gets caught off guard by the newly revived Cloud Man, being taken by him much like Mega Man earlier on. Without a doubt, it's the biggest blow the team received so far, everyone unanimously agreeing that the only duo capable of filling Colonel's shoes are Lan and Mega Man. Of course, hearing that, the two feel crushed, Lan rejecting the offer as he doesn't feel like he's qualified to be a leader. So in order to make up for all the trouble she's caused, Rabita jumps into action, trying everything to motivate Lan into being a leader, even going so far as sending Toad Man into the Undernet, trying to lure Mega Man in to convince the two. And when Mega Man finally reaches Toad Man, their fight is a bit different from how it used to be, what with Five's new addition of water panels. Granted, even with the changes, Toad Man doesn't stand a chance against the incredible powers of Cactus Roll. Nevertheless, despite losing the battle, Toad Man achieves their initial goal, the rest of Team Colonel showing up to convince Lan and Mega
Mega Man once and for all. Thus, as they finally accepted the role of leader, the brothers take Team Colonel into the internet's last liberation, the Nebula Navi this time being a corrupted colonel. Now normally, that'd be pretty intimidating, but with the buffing ability of Toad Man, this mission was another smooth one. Huh, guess you can't catch all the spelling errors. Though with that, Nebula takes Colonel away before the team gets a chance to recover him, moving forward with their plan to start transmitting some unknown signal. However, real quick, Mega Man also gets the Toad Soul here, a water soul that allows Mega Man to hide in water panels. Neat. Then, in the Proto Man version, there's the Medi Soul, acquired from the self-same Navi, Medi. Another personal favorite of mine when it comes to Medi's design, the Medi Soul is a pretty unique one, taking the healing chip slot like the Roll Soul did. Except instead of just being good for healing, the Medi Soul allows Mega Man to attach capsules to attacks, different colored capsules providing different effects. It's pretty cool, and can make for some pretty fun attacks if you learn which capsule does what. Anyways, getting back on track, with Nebula gaining access to Gao, the digital dog turning out to be the Hikari report all along, Regal activates something called Soulnet, all the people in each area except Orin Island having their personalities warped as a result. So to try to fix this brand new crisis, Lan has to scour each area for microservers hidden inside different devices, and upon reaching the last one, it's guarded by none other than Colonel, who still seems firmly under the influence of Nebula. Luckily, that won't last for much longer, as with the arrival of Toad Man followed by Proto Man, they managed to bring him back to his senses. I will say, it's pretty neat seeing how they overlapped the two team leaders, if only for a little bit. Plus, upon saving him, this is where Five bestows the final soul, fittingly being either the Colonel Soul or the Proto Soul. While the Proto Soul works more or less like it did in 4, the Colonel Soul is another beast entirely. Focused around obstacle battle chips, the Colonel Soul has two main features, one of them allowing Mega Man to change his charge shot into any neutral chip that doesn't dim the screen. Seems simple enough, except with the other feature, you kind of need to dedicate a portion of your folder to it for it to even be usable. Basically, if an enemy moves next to an obstacle, that obstacle will transform into a soldier that'll attack them. It's a cool concept, but to use it to its fullest, it'll take a good amount of strategy. Anyhow, after completing the team for good, it's time to get to the bottom of what Nebula has been doing, land finding the answer in one last vision burst hidden on the internet. This time, rather than it being one of the areas in 5, the location of this vision burst seems familiar in a different sense, the two scientists within it being a younger Dr. Wily and Tadashi Hikari. Overhearing the archived conversation, the two discuss a system they created, it apparently having the potential to create a world free of strife. To achieve that end, Soulnet has the capability to convert the very souls of every person into data, linking them together, emotions and all. However, it seems like they never finished it entirely, leaving the rest of the research to their kids. I'll be frank, there were various ways I saw the plot heading, and absolutely none of them were Battle Network incorporating the instrumentality project of all things. What a heavy twist. So now that Regal's goals are clear, Team Colonel heads off to stop the third impact, arriving at Nebula's stereotypical volcano headquarters. Compared to all the other final stages, this one definitely ranks pretty high, as taking advantage of Five's team aspect, each area of the Dark Chip Factory needs to be navigated by multiple navvies, allowing each team member to shine, if only for a little bit. In turn, after Nebula whittles down the team bit by bit, Mega Man and Lan manage to reach Regal, the villain planning to use Soulnet to link people like it was intended, except in order to sow evil and distrust in every society. And unlike basically every villain, Regal succeeds once again, activating Soul net and installing something called Nebula Grey in order to corrupt it. So to prevent the deranged Regal from ruining everything, Mega Man goes in to stop Nebula Grey, all the friends you've made along the way stepping in to help Mega Man continue. It's corny as hell, but I personally love stuff like this. Thus, as Mega Man reaches Nebula Grey, a program which Regal created to emulate all the evil aspects of mankind, Five's final battle begins. Now next to all the other final fights, while Duo still remains the hardest for me, I found Nebula grade to be far more fun in comparison, the fight taking my all to actually defeat. I will admit, the only reason I won was again due to grass panel cheese, but it was not even remotely as easy to cheese as Alpha was. Despite me losing a lot, I remained super pumped throughout the entire fight, due to the theme of this battle being out of this world. In fact, I'd go so far to say that Nebula Grey honestly has one of the best final boss themes out of any Battle Network game. It's seriously great. Nevertheless, once you've memorized their 
their attacks to the point of instinctively moving in circles to avoid those flames, Mega Man deals the final blow, Nebula Grey seemingly being defeated. However, despite losing that intense battle, Nebula Grey's core appears to still be active, trapping Mega Man in flames. Then, in possibly one of the most hype points of the series, the link between Lan and Mega Man gives him the strength to overcome Nebula Grey, for the first time in the series actually transforming into Hub. Though even after all that, Nebula Grey still has some strength, Mega Man nearly succumbing to its power if not for all of Team Colonel lending a helping hand. Like before, it's an extremely anime scene, but it makes for one incredible finale. So with that, Nebula Grey is no more, Regal's base beginning to crumble much like his father's had many times before. To get to safety, everyone is forced to leave the area, all except for Lan's dad, staying behind to try to reason with Regal one last time to complete their father's dreams. But unfortunately, Regal is too far gone, still rejecting Hikari's offer in spite of it all. Still, continuing with the finale that keeps on giving, one last person comes to Regal's aid, it being the very villain we've all come to know too well, Dr. Wily. And in an uncharacteristic act of kindness, he uses his admin powers over Soulnet to wipe Regal's memories of the past 10 years, hoping it'll allow his son to start anew. Of note, it seems Wily also knows Beryl, as he leaves his son in his care before taking his leave. It seems like a bit of an offhand thing when you see it, but just keep that in mind. Fun fact, this scene is actually only in the Colonel version, the Proto Man version just having an off-screen voice wipe Regal's memories. Why they chose to make that a version exclusive, I honestly can't say. Guess that means Colonel is the canon version of Battle Network 5. Anyways, after saving the day, Team Colonel regroups at Scilab, a reformed Regal joining up with Dr. Hikari to finally pursue the work left behind by their fathers. So with that, Battle Network 5 is officially over, the only thing left to do being the usual Battle Network postgame. Now here's the thing, like a lot of 5, its postgame is undeniably better than 4's, though unfortunately, that's not to say it's on the level of 3's postgame either, as it kind of boils down to more liberation missions accompanied by harder versions of pre-existing fights. And at least with me, since these liberation missions don't introduce any new mechanics, it was here where they started getting a bit old for me. Oh, and Base appears at the end of the postgame of course, his appearance this time being determined by how long it takes you to beat certain fights beforehand. Plus, aside from that, if you obtain the base cross, there's a bonus fight with base along with a few new interactions, but unfortunately, it still boils down to his only character trait post-3 of being power hungry. Thus, all that being said, that's Battle Network 5. Minus completing the game all the way, I had a real blast playing this one, the game serving to remind me what Battle Network is supposed to be following whatever 4 was. But unfortunately, with the game releasing towards the end of the Game Boy Advance's lifespan, it was at this point that the series began to wither away in sales, the game doing worse than 4 despite being vastly better. And despite 5 already releasing in the Game Boy Advance's Twilight Years, Capcom would still develop one more Battle Network game for the handheld. Putting it out even further into the already waning lifespan of the Game Boy Advance, Mega Man Battle Network 6 Gregar and Falzar would be the final entry in the Battle Network franchise. The thing is, as opposed to less fortunate Mega Man franchises, the devs already knew this would be the last Battle Network game during development, meaning they'd be able to put everything they had into making sure the series ended right, and take it from me, they succeeded. Much like how Battle Network 3 was the best of the first trilogy, Battle Network 6 is the best of the latter trilogy trilogy, bearing gameplay improvements that further refine the mechanics introduced in the past two games. First, let's talk Souls, the main mechanic that the series has latched onto. In Battle Network 6, Souls are modified into the Cross system, a system that works more or less the same as the Soul system, with two key differences. Now, rather than always having to sacrifice chips to use Souls, Crosses can be used without any sacrifices at all, a change that no joke elevated the system to being my all-time favorite out of every Battle Network game. Though, there is a catch. To make up for crosses also lasting indefinitely until you change to another, receiving any damage that's super effective against that cross's weakness will remove it permanently for that fight, adding a new strategic angle to things. So with a lot of freedoms restored to folder building, Battle Network 6 is kind of a return to basics in some ways, especially when it comes to the game's plot. But we'll get to that in a bit. On top of the cross system, 6 boosts Mega Man's power even further with the Beast Out system, which depending on the version you get, changes Mega Man 
then into a powerful primal form, the transformation stacking with a cross if you have one equipped. Like the soul system, Beast Out can only be used normally for three turns, the limiter being justified here as using Beast Out in the right situations can lead to an easy win, since basically it just makes Mega Man even stronger, adding such abilities as auto-targeting with chips and unique neutral chip charge attacks for each Beast Cross you can use. It's so powerful in fact that after using up those three turns, it takes three battles without using Beast Out to get them back, or much easier, just jacking out. Though unlike Souls, Beast Out is still usable after using up all the available turns, the use of it past that point triggering a Beast Over, which much like Dark Invisibility in 5, sends Mega Man into an uncontrollable fury, all his movements and attacks happening randomly. Now hearing that, Beast Over sounds even more powerful, but here's the thing, once it runs out, Mega Man is left exhausted, all his buster stats being reduced to 1 and his HP decreasing faster than it takes the custom bar to recharge. Needless to say, if you're aware of the risks and take a healthy bit of caution, Beast Out is one of the coolest features ever, adding just enough spice to 6 to keep things fresh. But on the other hand, 6 removed a few things as well, mainly the dark chip system in its entirety. And personally, while I did enjoy Chaos Unison in 5, Beast Out more than surpassed it for me, so its removal didn't change much at all in my opinion. Plus, with the Dark Soul exclusive chips, 6 brought them back as normal chips. Everyone wins. However, aside from Beast Out and Crosses, they would modify folder building, now restricting chips based on their megabyte size and sliding in the cool new feature of tag chips. Basically, if you tag two chips that don't exceed 60 megabytes combined, you can guarantee that they'll show up together on the custom screen, allowing you to create surefire combos that can be real satisfying to pull off. With me, I'd pair the bubble chips with Blast Man, demolishing enemies when they're lined up right. In the grand scheme of things, it is an unnecessary change, but it's such a fun one. Outside of that, the rest of Six's changes are just general improvements to the overall game, everything from sprites to chips being modified for the better. For example, take Crackout. Normally, I'd always remove them from my folder the first chance I got, but in Battle Network 6, they upgraded them into versatile attacks, a massive improvement to say the least. Overall, Capcom really made as many improvements as they could fit into that tiny handheld, and to cover the rest of them, let's now dive into the story. Starting off in a more melancholic way, Battle Network 6 opens with Lan moving out of ACDC Town, his father's work taking the family to a place called Cyber City as he needs to prepare the city's internet for the expo that'll be held there soon. Off the bat, as great as ACDC Town is, I was pretty happy with the change of scenery in this game, 6 bringing in a lot more new assets than usual for a Battle Network game. For one, while 3 still holds first place when it comes to internet design, 6 is an extremely close second if not a perfect tie as its internet is super diverse, each area having a different design focus aside from merely changing its color. There's even these little net cafes in each new area, making the internet feel more inhabited than ever before. Though moving on with the story, it's Lan's first day at his new school, everything going pretty smoothly all around. Hell, this school even has its own discount decks named Mick. It's like we never left. And as the school day progresses, Capcom decided to nudge the Battle Network universe a bit closer to that of the main one with the introduction of copybots, usually blank robots that if a navi enters, allows that navi to interact with the real world. Nothing much happens with them now other than Mega Man entering his brother's world for the first time, but they'll become pretty important. As in true Battle Network fashion, no school land enters is safe, the security robots of the school all of a sudden spewing flames everywhere. Thus, with the help of Mega Man via a copybot, land manages to reach the control center of the robots, truly kicking the game off with the first stage. Taking after the very first game with a fire-centric stage, this one is pretty simple, Mega Man merely having to get behind obstacles to avoid the oncoming fire. And at the end of the stage is Blast Man, a fire navi who tricked Mick into uploading him to the school's computer. Like you'd expect, he isn't much of a challenge at all, Blast Man getting blasted by Mega Man. I will say, out of every game in the series, Battle Network 6 just barely managed to make a boss theme that surpassed all others for me, it never failing to get me incredibly pumped in each battle it shows up in. So with Lan already establishing a reputation at his new school, he makes another new friend, Tab, a kid who basically runs the chip shop of the town. Rest in peace, Higsby. Anyways, past that, Lan and Mega Man take some time to explore their new local internet, the two learning that beneath Cyber City's internet lie two Cybeasts from the internet's earlier days, Cybeast Gregar and Cybeast Falzar. Apparently, the two were constantly locked in battle, leaving only devastation in their wake. At some point though, their fight 
came to a close, the two rumored to still exist at the bottom of a chasm formed during their final clash. But who cares about that, as sometime later back at school, Mick has a penguin for some reason, Land discovering that it's actually a penguin who ran away from the aquarium of the neighboring seaside town. In turn, to bring the penguin back to where it belongs, the kids take it to the aquarium the next day, the outing not being too much out of the ordinary until all of a sudden, right before the kids go back to Cyber City, all the fish and animals of the aquarium escape. Hmm, now where have I seen this scenario before? Oh well, guess we'll never know. Upon making it back to the aquarium though, the released animals make things pretty hard to reach the aquarium's control panel, and weirdly, a girl Land met early on in the game appears, guiding Land to a copy bot, all the while seemingly teleporting all over the place. But we'll worry about that later, as with Mega Man's help, Land gets to the control panel, the aquarium's past animal trainer who'd recently been fired, getting revenge by sabotaging the place. So entering the game's second stage, Following the trend set by the fifth game's water stage, this one is also the worst one of the game. Basically, the mechanic this time is Mega Man needs to match animal programs with the containers they belong in. Sounds simple enough, but when you're bringing a program back, sharks appear, forcing you to avoid them while returning. To give credit where credit is due, it is pretty cool how the music changes during the shark segments, though other than that, it became tedious fast. I still enjoyed it, mind you, as that aforementioned music improved things, but it's not a stage I'd like to do again. Again. Anyways, after getting set back by a million sharks, Mega Man comes face to face with Dive Man, a submarine-esque Navi whose design I enjoyed a lot. Too bad there wasn't much else to him, as his fight was also fairly easy. Granted, later on when Dive Man's harder versions appear online, he did kind of make me eat those words. However, with Dive Man defeated, the aquarium is saved, all the animals returning to their tanks and enclosures. If you haven't picked up on it now, as far as Six's plot goes, it's definitely more reminiscent of the older games, land going around solving problems with internet-focused segments in between. And with those internet segments, even they are about to be enhanced in a certain way. You see, as opposed to how the souls were handled, wherein you only got them via story progression, Six lets you get crosses more freely after the course needed to get them becomes available. For me, this flexible approach worked out real well, as I always went for them as soon as possible. And after the aquarium debacle, Six opens up the first cross, land getting it from either Shuko, that gloomy girl from 4, or Mr. Match, a man who needs no introduction. Starting with Shugo, since I played Falzar before Gregar, she's apparently cheered up a considerable bit since 4, albeit still helping her brothers out by paying their tuition. Plus, now she's become a full-on teacher at Lan's school, so clearly something is working out for her. Though while Lan gets his stuff from the classroom before starting the course, it is worth noting that the same enigmatic girl who's appeared throughout the game shows up again, Lan learning that her name is Iris. Bit of a disclaimer, I've never properly played any of the Mega Man X games, so I didn't think anything was out of the ordinary here when I originally played 6. But for those of you who have played those games, it makes it even more clear that there may be more to this girl than meets the eye. Anyhow, back to the course, in order for Mega Man to gain a new cross, Lan needs to become accustomed to operating the Navi Mega Man will be getting the cross from, meaning that thankfully, Battle Network 6 brought back 5's feature of multiple playable Navis. So for Shuko, Lan needs to operate Aquaman, who in 6 got renamed to Spout Man due to to their previous name having some copyright issues. I must say, while I am a bit bummed they never brought back Junkman in the main series, I was pretty glad to see Spoutman, their design being one of my personal favorites from 4. In turn, much like their original tournament scenario, a mistake on Shuko's behalf leads to Seaside Town's internet flooding, it falling on Spoutman to recover all the fish data that escaped in the flood. Overall, it's an enjoyable little segment, the rest of the courses also having unique segments of their own, and after sending the little guy to swim all over the place, Place, the course wraps up with a fight against Spout Man, Mega Man obtaining the Spout Cross. As opposed to the Aqua Soul, Spout Cross is more or less the same, the only difference being it heals Mega Man every time a water chip is used, which can obviously come in handy. Though getting to the real star of the show, there's Mr. Match, making his final appearance in the series. Apparently finally landing on the good side of the tracks, Mr. Match has started making a real effort to turn his life around, even attending a college. So going to his class to learn how to operate fire navvies, Match shows Lan how to operate Heat Man, making a return from 2. Now considering that Heat Man is probably my favorite Navi in the entire series, I can't describe the genuine excitement I felt when the game revealed that he was controllable. It honestly made my day. However, the mechanic for his course isn't much, it coming down to doing enough consecutive fire damage to kill enemies. And standing out from the other early game fights, Heat Man is a fair bit more challenging, his original moveset from 2 receiving all new attacks. Then, with the Heat Cross itself, it's a straightforward power boost.
boost to fire chips, not unlike the fire soul before it. For such a memorable returning character, I'm pretty glad they gave Match some closure. With series like these, you don't see that too often. So moving on, once Lan leaves the school, a suspicious clown lady is advertising an internet event, Lan making plans with his friends to attend. Except before Lan gets the opportunity to go on the internet, Iris shows up to warn him, the warning proving to save Mega Man as the newly introduced Clown Man absorbs all the energy of the Navis who'd attended. And depending on the version, Clown Man even manages to absorb one of them, nearly capturing the other if not for authorities stepping in. Regardless, after Clown Man's actions, a Psybeast is now loose on the net, its appearance already causing havoc with evil spirits popping up everywhere, the game introducing a little mini-game where Mega Man defeats them with limited weapons. Now usually, I wouldn't be the biggest fan of something like this, except during these little minigame segments, Capcom was gracious enough to turn off random encounters, making everything much less tedious. In turn, once Mega Man reaches the side beast, he's forced to make a tough decision. You see, much like Clown Man, Mega Man also has a massive amount of memory built into him, in his case the memory holding all the information of his human DNA. Though since he has that capability, Mega Man chooses to take the side beast into himself in order to save the internet at large, a sacrifice that could could very well tear him apart. Man, usually you'd see something like this towards the end of a Battle Network game. It's kind of insane seeing how much Six escalates the plot this early on. To make matters worse, the absorption of the Psy Beast immediately takes its toll on Mega Man, the Navi being on the verge of coming apart. Luckily for Lan, he has some pretty reliable friends, the Link Navi you unlocked earlier on and now serving to give Lan a way to help Mega Man. Thus, a couple more dead spirits later, Lan manages to bring the healing water of the seaside area back to Mega Man, it's seemingly helping him, only for the Psy Beast to take control, its form merging with Mega Man's. Though with the help of the Link Navi, Mega Man just barely manages to take control, locking away the Psy Beast for now. So with that, after Mega Man recovers, this is where Six introduces Beast Out, the powerful transformation allowing Mega Man to exact some pretty immediate revenge against Clown Man. Good riddance. Next, in a brief period of peace, a contest starts in order to select one Navi that'll serve as a guide during the expo, all the while using a copy bot. Much like the preliminaries for the N1 and 3, this'll serve as Six's B-plot for a bit while Lan solves more problems. And to get to the next problem, Lan goes to a new area called Greentown, a safe haven for for nature that also happens to be the center of all judiciary activities in the region. In fact, Lan is there for that exact thing, being called in to testify against the man who'd caused the aquarium incident. Inside the courtroom, Lan meets the prosecutor who'll be convicting the man, a guy named Ito. But that's not all he's known for, as aside from being successful as a prosecutor, Ito is responsible for creating the Judge Tree, a tree with a computer crammed inside it that permanently replaces the need for a human judge. Now compared to all the futuristic tech of Battle Network, the Judge Tree is by far the most dystopian thing, this society essentially relying on an easily modifiable computer for the management of the justice system. Though I digress, after witnessing the judge tree in action, it's sentencing the man to something called the punishment room, Lan leaves the courthouse, somehow not at all disturbed by the incredibly messed up stuff he'd just witnessed. And to get our minds off that, at this point a new cross is available, the wind-focused Tengu cross or the sword-centric slash cross. With the Tengu cross coming from Tengu Man, he was definitely one of the more interesting new navvies added, his little course boiling down to you sending Tengu Man to collect scrolls across Greentown's internet. But with the actual Tengu Cross, it functions more or less like the Windsoul did. Then, with the Slash Cross obtained from Slash Man, after you go around slicing cyber veggies, the Slash Cross has a couple neat features, the Cross boosting sword chips, adding a charge shot much like that of the Tomahawk Soul, and letting you charge normal sword chips for a sonic boom. So it does differentiate itself enough from the Proto Soul. However, back to the plot, things take a a drastic turn for the worse, Lan's father being arrested for allegedly hacking the judge tree. See, I told you that tree was bad news. And after some independent investigation on their own, Lan and Mega Man produce an alibi for Dr. Hikari, at the same time also finding out that Ito was behind the scheme all along. Thus, to save their dad from literally receiving medieval justice in the torture chair, Lan jacks Mega Man into the judge tree, starting the third stage. With this one, the main gist of the stage is Mega Man can't go back on a platform he's already walked on. The punishment for doing so being a severe bonk. It's another fairly simple mechanic, but it's also surprisingly easy to back yourself into a corner with this one, the movable camera thankfully allowing you to plan moves ahead of time. Overall, a pretty solid stage, the music getting a chef's kiss on my behalf. Then, when Mega Man reaches the end of it, fittingly, Ito's Navi is Judge Man, the ironically criminal Navi not putting up much of a fight against Mega Man turning into a beast and mauling him. So with Greentown's bizarre justice system saved, Ito gets convicted by the very 
computer he created, Dr. Hikari's innocence thankfully saving him from whatever nightmare the punishment room entails. Though after this point, Six casually drops some massive information out of nowhere, showing a bit of this game's criminal HQ and unveiling Barrel as one of its members. No joke, this twist actually caught me pretty off guard, something that Battle Network plots rarely manage to do this early on. What's more, following Barrel's conversation with another criminal, the syndicate they're all a part of is shown to be none other than World 3, fittingly returning for the third time. Guess it should have been obvious, what with Wily seemingly knowing Barrel at the end of 5, but wow, props to the devs for keeping it secret this far into the game. However, moving on, the next segment pushes Battle Network's future science even further with Skytown, a town that's permanently flying in the sky which controls the weather of the region. Upon arriving, Land takes part in the next portion of the contest, Mega Man fighting an onslaught of viruses to pass. Plus, connected to Skytown's internet is this game's undernet, Mega Man venturing inside to save Mix Navi. Except once Mega Man reaches Mix Navi, a bunch of Psybeast worshippers ambush them, performing a chant that incapacitates Mega Man. Like the last time, this is another part of the game where you've got to play as another Navi, Six thankfully letting you choose whoever you want. Although, unlike last time, just reaching Mega Man isn't enough to save him, the Psybeast almost taking complete control if it wasn't for a mysterious, totally not Proto Man Navi stepping in to save the day. And from here, things only escalate further, the weather systems of Skytown getting hijacked by World 3, each area's weather going haywire as a result. But forget about all that, it's cross time. Like the first round, the Navis this time are also from other games, Tomahawk Man and, shockingly, a Lek Man returning. For Tomahawk Man, there's not much to go over, the course involving a few minigames where you attack totems, and the Tomahawk Cross just being a slightly nerfed Tomahawk Soul, as it doesn't cover the stage with grass upon use. But for a Lek Man, boy do I have something to talk about. It was one thing for them to bring back my favorite Navi design, but for them to bring back another one of my favorites? Needless to say, I was pretty happy. And the story for this one is interesting too, because after World 3's original defeat in 1, Count Zap, a man who's clearly in full possession of his mental faculties, was arrested, his Navi Alec man being given to his wife and Zap. Though due to him being arrested, the once prestigious Zap family would fall to ruins, and giving it her all to try to restore it to its former glory. So operating a grumpy Alec man, Lance sends him around the sky area to recharge the batteries that provide the area with light. Like some of the other little events, this is another where they thankfully turned off random encounters again. In turn, once you take care of that and defeat a Lek Man a second time, Anne admits that she knows who Lan is, thanking the kid for giving her husband a chance to become a better person. Honestly, for such a forgettable character as Count Zap, it was pretty nice seeing even him receiving closure by proxy. I've said it before and I'll say it again, when franchises take advantage of their previous entries, it makes for an incredibly rewarding experience. And with the Elect Cross, it's about what you'd expect, the cross powering up electric chips and allowing normal chips to paralyze enemies if you charge them. Anyhow, back to the ongoing weather crisis, Land makes it indoors to where all the systems are controlled, jacking Mega Man in and entering the fourth stage. Now for this one, you may disagree with me, but this stage was honestly one of my all-time favorites in the entire franchise, the mechanic of zooming around on a cloud to collect bits of data being a blast for me. Like, who doesn't love a bit of canvas curse every now and then? Not to mention, as per usual, the stage music was super solid, this track quickly becoming another favorite of mine. Though at the end, there's Element Man, a boss which proved to be kind of a joke for me, what with the veritable arsenal of crosses Mega Man has at this point. So with that taken care of, that should be the end of Skytown's troubles, except much to Land's dismay, Colonel shows up in a copybot, allowing Element Man's operator to escape and nearly killing Lan himself if not for Iris showing up to defend him. Plus, to make her true identity even more clear, she manages to save Skytown from crashing down, averting what would have been a disastrous event. Thus, as that whole segment comes to a close, it's time to get more crosses. Upon returning to Cyber City, the contest is almost over, Land competing in the last round to win Mega Man his prize. And once that's all done, the game promptly opens up the last available crosses, all of them proving to be pretty solid. Starting with Falzar, there's the Ground Cross and Dust Cross, the latter being a cross I used a lot towards the end of the game. For the Ground Cross though, the Link Navi is Ground Man, a pretty massive Navi who definitely took some notes from Drill Man. For this course, all you've gotta do is drill through rocks, which sounds easy until you take the timing mechanic into effect. I swear, I got so close to winning on my first try, it's not even funny. But after that, once Mega Man gets the ground cross, this one can lead to some clutch victories if used right. Because alongside powering up break chips, coming with super armor, and adding falling rocks when you charge normal chips, its charge shot allows Mega Man to disappear briefly before attacking, the attack allowing you to avoid enemy attacks if you time it correctly. No joke, it's 
solely due to the ground cross that I beat base later on, but I'm getting ahead of myself. The dust cross is also really good, it's Link Navi Dust Man being a trash compactor with legs. So after helping him do what he's made to do, the dust cross is definitely more on the unique side. For one, it gives Mega Man the ability to suck obstacles in and shoot them out. A situational ability, sure, but a decently strong one at that. However, in the chip select screen, Dust Cross lets you discard a chip to the back of your folder, allowing you to get more chips you need, kind of like an improved version of the add button. So all that, combined with a charge attack I abused a bit too much, makes for a really great cross. But then, in the Gregar version, there's the Erase Cross and Charge Cross, another pair of well-rounded crosses. With the Erase Cross, Lan gets to meet an apprentice of Dusk named Dark Scythe, a name that exudes such palpable edge, it's radioactive. Operating the Navi Erase Man, he's about what you'd expect from a Navi whose sole purpose is to assassinate, his course being a stealth mission of sorts where you kill gang members in the Undernet. Thankfully, unlike that other stealth mission, getting caught here just leads to a battle. And upon getting the Erase Cross, Mega Man receives a big power-up, the cross bearing the absolute best charge shot in the game. Plus, on top of that, if you damage a virus with a 4 on its health, the Erase Cross immediately kills it, Navi's receiving an HP virus if you do the same to them. While I do get the necessity of having element-focused crosses, I wish there were more insane ones like this, as these perks were so cool to make use of. Though then, with the Charge Cross, we get to play as Charge Man, a Navi who's literally just a train. Now, as you'd expect, this was definitely my favorite new Navi in 6, the concept being so ridiculous, I kind of loved it. After all, one of Battle Network's greatest strengths was its ability to make crazy designs, due to everything being on the internet. So after taking passengers to other parts of the internet in a minigame that definitely took up a considerable part of the game's memory, the Charge Cross is another Fire Cross, its main perk aside from boosting fire chips being that with every turn, the custom screen gains one new slot, providing a pretty big incentive to use it. Hell, the charge shot for this one can also be used to dodge attacks. Although personally, I do feel like they maybe should have swapped Charge Man with Dust Man and Gregar, as having two fire-aspected crosses in one game did feel a bit excessive. But with that, Mega Man has now acquired all the crosses of the game, things beginning to gear up for the finale. To take a minor breather after all the turmoil he's been in, Lan gets to visit ACDC Town, reuniting with all his old friends. And while it is nice to see the town one last time, it is a bit melancholic, especially with how the friends areas on the internet got kind of gutted. At least they managed to squeeze them in somehow. But to everyone's dismay, clearly Lan's friends haven't changed since the last game. Their navvies getting kidnapped by some members of World 3 rebelling against Beryl, and using the opportunity to snatch Mega Man after he saves them. To make matters worse, Soon after obtaining Mega Man, they put him into a copy bot while under the Psybeast's control, allowing the Psybeast to wreak havoc in the real world. Thankfully, both Lan and Iris manage to arrive before things get any worse, but the damage is already done, the mayor of Cyber City revoking Mega Man's recently won spot as the Operator Navi. So with Mega Man lost once more, Lan is devastated, his teacher Mr. Mock admitting to Lan that he's been part of World 3 all along, the teacher being the true Operator of Blast Man. Though since he regrets his actions, he lets Lan know that Mega Man retreated to the underground, the part of the internet where the Psybeasts originally slept. Consequently, to snap Mega Man out of the Psybeast spell, Lan goes to the mayor to get a pass to enter the underground, happening to walk in while he's talking to one of the World 3 betrayers, inadvertently revealing his true intentions to Lan. You see, in the early days of the internet, large numbers of bugs began gathering within the cyber world, the clumps of bugs eventually coming together to form the Psybeast Gregar, answering why it looks so much like gospel. For a bit, Gregar ran rampant across the internet, mindlessly ravaging everything in sight. That is, until one day when a scientist created a program to take care of Gregar. The issue with that was, during a fight to the death with Gregar, the program went haywire, becoming the second Psybeast, Falzar. Of course, due to its core programming, Falzar continued to fight with Gregar endlessly, allowing officials to temporarily solve the problem by trapping the two in the underground. However, for that scientist, his reputation would never recover, living out the rest of his days scorned by all those around him. As it turns out, that scientist was the mayor's grandfather, the mayor revealing his true motivations. But unfortunately for him, someone other than Lan was listening, the mayor's mysterious bodyguard that's shown up a couple times in the game turning out to be Chod. Wow, didn't see that one coming. Subsequent to that, the mayor's schemes are no more, resolving one of Six's major plot points. Then, as Mega Man is still trapped in the underground, Lan operates one of the Link navvies to reach him, the Psybeast fighting that navvy through Mega Man's body. And after that, while Mega Man 
Batman is recovered yet again, there's still another fight, Colonel showing up and destroying all in his path. Compared to his fights in 5, Colonel definitely stepped up his game in 6, the fight being fairly challenging unless you blow through it with program advances. Like, if you stay in the fight a bit too long, he'll do this attack where after blinding you with his cape, he absolutely demolishes you. Scary damage numbers aside, it's definitely one of the coolest attacks in the game. Anyways, moving on, after going through a whole plot point with those X-World 3 members, Mr. Mock just barely manages to save Beryl from being pushed into the ocean unconscious, telling Lan that the only reason he's in World 3 is to repay his debt to Dr. Wily, due to the doctor actually saving his terminally ill daughter many years ago. Not to mention, Beryl helped Mr. Mock out as well, giving a younger Mock purpose earlier in his life. So following that, it's time for the expo that's been built up for the entire game, Lan and friends gaining access to it a day before it opens to the public. Except when the group reaches the end of the expo, they're met with the rude awakening that it's been World 3's base all along, the Syndicate sending punk navvies all across Cyber City and commencing the final segment of the game. Entering the last stage in not just Battle Network 6, but the series at large, it's really something else, World 3 getting closer to succeeding than ever before as they take over everything. And as Lan is constantly chasing the World 3 offshoots, getting ever closer to defeating them entirely with each stage, it makes for one hell of a final area. Though above all, it's the music of this one that ties everything together, the entire track being nothing short of legendary. I mean, hear it for yourself. After the last one, you knew I was gonna do this at some point of the video, it's practically a given with me at this point. Like while the final stage of 3 is still firmly one of the best segments in the entire series, in my opinion the final stage of 6 is the closest Battle Network gets to that level again, it all coming together beautifully. And with the defeat of Clown Man once and for all, Lan approaches his final confrontation with Dr. Wily. Entering the room with Beryl, who'd recently regained the will to change what he deems to be his own destiny, Wily stands before two massive copybots, admitting that he didn't foresee Beryl's betrayal. Because after all this time, Beryl's true identity is that of Wily's adopted son, the scientist also being the creator of Colonel. You see, after Wily's exile from the scientific community, he didn't go rogue immediately. Instead, for some time, he developed military robots for an Utopian commander, only truly losing it when that commander met an untimely death on the battlefield. Since that man was Beryl's father, Wily did what he knew Beryl's father would have wanted, using all the combat data he'd accrued to make Beryl a stronger soldier than his father ever was. Compared to the raving scientist that he's been in all the other games, Six makes him out to be a bit more understandable, albeit still fairly evil. As it's revealed that on the day Beryl's father died, Wily modified Colonel to be the perfect combat navvy, taking the kindness data removed from Colonel to make Iris the perfect navvy for operating weapons. Thus, just like in the main series, Iris is Colonel's younger sister, her operating powers even being strong enough to call forth a Psy Beast, the one inside Mega Man resonating and joining the one Iris had called. Then, and just as everything seemed hopeless, Iris and Colonel betray Wily too, taking on the Psy Beast they entered and leaving the other one for Mega Man. In turn, as Mega Man enters the one corresponding to the version, that means that for Battle Network 6, each version has its own final boss. Talk about taking exclusives to the next level. And interestingly enough, the way each fight plays out kind of corresponds to their backstories. Falzar requiring more strategy to take down, and Gregar, well, more so requiring you to deal as much damage as you can without dying. Stacking them up with the rest of the final bosses in Battle Network, they more than fit the bill, both fights taking me a good bit to take down. Hell, with Gregar, I ended up resorting to continuously using the charge shot of Slash Cross, since any other way led to my swift demise. I guess it's fitting, considering Gospel also took way too many tries for me to actually win for once. Though with your version Psybeast defeated, you've defeated the final final boss. But knowing the Psybeasts, they're not done yet, Mega Man being inhabited once more. As a result, the only ones capable of saving 
defeating Mega Man now are Iris and Colonel, the two deciding to reunite as one to destroy the Psybeast permanently. Sadly, in doing so, they ensure their own destruction, what with Wily putting a program within them that'll cause immediate death if they ever become one again. So disregarding the threat of death, Iris and Colonel fuse to kill the Psybeast, their explosion taking it out with them. To be frank, when I saw this in my first playthrough, I was taken aback. After all, Battle Network has proven to be a series that doesn't have any permanent character deaths. Yet, surely enough, Six defies those expectations, killing off Colonel, who I'd become especially attached to due to Five, and Iris, who after becoming pretty developed before the fight, was honestly an equally sad death. Bravo, Battle Network. You made me feel feelings once again. So back to outside the copy bots, Colonel's explosion has begun to affect the real world, while he refusing to leave, as he doesn't believe he has anything to live for anymore. Along with the scenes before the fight, it's pretty crazy seeing Six give Wily some actual humanity, Land trying to reason with him before Barrel shows up and forces him to go, Wily saying one last goodbye before the entire complex explodes. However, despite all that, Wily still survived. Guess it shouldn't be surprising considering all the other situations he's lived through, but now he can finally be held accountable for his crimes. All in all, ending the game right where it started, Land's graduation is back at his old school, a couple familiar names sending their congratulations to the kids from afar, including Massa of all people. Even now, an entire franchise later, it seems like I still can't escape Shark Man. Honestly, it's all really touching, Barrel even being confirmed to have survived as he left a gift for Lan. So after they graduate, the kids regroup once more to discuss their aspirations. Of note, though it's not all that shocking, Chad is apparently going to university now. Truly, the kid has a giga brain if I've ever seen one. But going back to Barrel's present, as it turns out, it's a special copy bot just for Mega Man, allowing Lan to introduce him as Hub for the very first time. Subsequently, as all the kids agreed to remain friends forever, Battle Network 6 cuts to credits. On its own, Six's ending is already perfect, yet just to add on it, the after credits scene this time around takes the cake. While it doesn't really show much on screen, after the credits, the game jumps ahead 20 years later. Compared to when Lan was a kid, the internet has now been vastly improved by none other than Dr. Wily, who during his time in jail developed a new kernel in Iris to constantly monitor and repair the internet, preventing any organization like World 3 from ever surfacing again. And in Lan's personal life, he of course ended up with Mail, the two having a kid of their own named Patch. Clearly, Lan gets his naming ability from his father. Plus, like all the kids had set out to do, each of them have now achieved their goals. Dex becoming the mayor of ACDC Town, Yai becoming the president of her father's company, Mick becoming a teacher, Chad becoming the leader of all officials, and Lan becoming a world-renowned scientist just like his father, working to build a better future for all. Thus, with that, the Battle Network series receives its ending, a luxury most franchises never even get. But before I go into full on reminiscing, Battle Network 6 still has a bit more with its postgame. Now, unfortunately, the postgame of 6 still doesn't reach the level of 3's postgame, but it's definitely the best out of the latter trilogy. Starting off with a base fight which you can technically access fairly early on in the game, trust me, I found this out the hard way, 6's postgame is an area called the Graveyard, an ominous zone that has the gravestones of every Navi in the game. If you explore it enough, the area has another harder base fight, base's defeat leading to one more fight in the underground ground where he actually makes use of the Psybeast's power. Of course, you don't need me to tell you that these fights are all insanely hard, the final base fight absolutely wrecking me until I manage to scrape by with a win. However, that seems a bit short for a Battle Network postgame, right? Well, if you think so too, then there's a good reason for that feeling, because for the most part, Six's postgame was gutted in the West. This was because, for a lot of it, Six's postgame had all the Boktai content, the graveyard originally being composed of two areas, the Undernet originally having three areas, and there being another area beyond the graveyard called the Immortal Area. Hell, in cutting the Boktai content, they even removed the only other new post-game fight aside from all the base, which was pretty saddening to learn after completing 6 myself. In fact, within the graveyard area they cut, there's also gravestones for the navvies from every other Battle Network game. As with Boktai's general lack of success outside Japan, I guess that was another reason to cut it, though the game would have largely benefited from its inclusion regardless. Of course, now, there do exist English patches of the Japanese version of 6, so you can see all the stuff they removed, but it's a major bummer that they did this to the last game no less. But aside from that, there is one more thing to do in the post-game, since in Battle Network 6, Capcom brought back side quests, all of them functioning more or less like they did in 3. And when you complete all of them, it unlocks a decently challenging Proto Man fight, so at least some of the cool post-game content remained intact. However, now, that's about it for Battle Network 6.
Closing the series off with one hell of a game, Battle Network's last entry would unfortunately do even worse than 5, its low sales marking the end of Battle Network's short-lived success. Honestly, with how 5 did, it's kind of a miracle 6 even happened, the reviews at the time definitely not helping, that's for sure. Imagine rating Battle Network 4 higher than 6, my god. When you look at all the games in the series, they really do embody the Game Boy Advance's lifespan, Capcom figuring out different ways to push the handheld further with each entry. And now that I come to you having played through them all, how about I rank them in retrospect? Without a doubt, at the bottom lies Battle Network 4. The reason for that, I'm sure you don't need me to explain. But even despite being a game I never want to see again, there still were times that I enjoyed myself. Take the improved fast travel between areas. It's a minor touch, but it beat having to get a ticket each time. Though above that, I'd put Battle Network 1. Like 4, 1 is also a game I wouldn't necessarily want to go back to, but it's nowhere near as bad in my eyes. After all, even though most of the other games were far more enjoyable, it jump-started something entirely new on a handheld that was also entirely new. Despite only playing it a few months ago now, I have an oddly nostalgic feeling when I look back at one, its internet theme in particular being one I cherish a lot. Above that, I'd put Battle Network 2. Like one, it was also kind of a stepping stone for the series, introducing styles which would eventually evolve into souls and crosses, and breathing far more life into the game with its internet. Granted, it did come with some flaws as well, but it succeeded in its purpose of being a solid sequel. Better than that, there's Battle Network 5, a game which served to try something new with the series, whether people liked it or not. I'll admit, my enjoyment of this game was a bit influenced by the fact that I really wanted to play something that wasn't 4, but even after getting over that feeling, 5 holds up for me. Above all, it really felt like its plot always had something new happening in it, which was incredibly fun to play through. Though at the top, I have to put both Battle Network 3 and 6 in the same spot. For me personally, I just can't really say I enjoyed one over the other, as they each have different parts that are better than the other. Like when it comes to 3, without a doubt it has the best plot out of any Battle Network game, the whole segment with Mamoru being a high point for the entire series. But on the other hand, with Battle Network 6, I'd say it reigns supreme when it comes to the gameplay, its refinements to the battle system creating so many opportunities to create different strategies. From the worst games in the series to the best, Battle Network consistently upheld a certain charm, whether it be its ever-evolving battle system or even minor things like the humor chip, 5 undoubtedly having the best one. And even past the games themselves, Battle Network also represents a pretty significant point in time, the internet in both the games and real life expanding tremendously in the early 2000s. It probably wasn't intentional, but when you look at each game's internet, things progressively become more advanced and populated, the internet eventually becoming a living, breathing society rather than a plain, uniform world. It's truly something to behold. To be honest, I'll kind of miss that feeling of wandering around the internet only for a random encounter to start are blaring the boss theme since I happened to run into a Navi ghost. Even up to Battle Network 6, that never failed to scare the hell out of me. And while Battle Network may be dead right now, with the exception of some mobile games that are kind of lost to time and some arcade games that released after 6, you'd better believe it isn't dead in the hearts of its fans, a small yet thriving community still persisting to this day. In fact, there's even a full-on fan game that's been in the works for a while. And can I just say, good on you everyone working on Chrono X, this game looks like it could truly be great. So without a doubt, there's still a sizable amount of Battle Network fans everywhere, meaning that Capcom, there's absolutely no reason at all not to give this series a legacy collection. Come on, I know you want to. Literally just a peek into my last Battle Network video's comment section will reveal an unending amount of people who agree with me here. Though now that I think about it, wasn't there one more significant Battle Network release? Oh yeah, that crossover remake of the first game. Don't worry, I haven't forgotten. Although before I can properly talk about that, there's another Mega Man series I've got to play, the successor to Battle Network's legacy, Mega Man Star Force. I even already have a copy of the first game, so I've actually been planning on covering this for a bit. But to give me a bit of a breather after blasting through all these games so quickly, I'll be playing Star Force 1 for the first time over on my Twitch. Right now, I'll be starting the first stream of it tomorrow at 8pm EST, so make sure to stop by. And since this video is on the longer side to say the least, if you miss the stream, I now also have a channel where I upload all my stream VODs, so do check that out if you're interested. But with that, there's Mega Man Battle Network, a gamble on Capcom's behalf to make a Mega Man RPG that in the end absolutely paid off.
Oh, and real quick before I go full outro, I've got to give a massive thank you to Aces Katsuro for helping me out with the footage from Battle Network 4 Blue Moon. Without their help, I would have had to play 4 another 3 times, and to be frank, this video would have taken at least another month to put out. Thanks, man! And now, to those who've continued to help out the channel, I'd like to give a heartfelt thank you to Ali Elman, Jules Lee, and everyone else who've decided to contribute. You guys are the best. If you want to help me continue making unnecessarily massive videos like these, and and receive a heartfelt thank you amongst a lot of other cool stuff, do check out my Patreon, link in the description. Wow, when I split this into two parts, I seriously didn't think my second part would be the length of a feature film. It's been a wild ride, that's for sure. I know I've said this before, but especially with this one, just thanks for watching all the way. I've put my heart and soul into these two Battle Network videos, and seeing how much people have enjoyed them is the greatest thing in the world. So that being said, I'm VRPG Monger, and don't forget that each and every one of you are fantastic.